I believe I am. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm joined today with Mildra the Monk. How are you doing today, Mildra? I am doing good. Thank you for having me. I enjoy being had. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Mildra here, he runs uh, uh, two podcasts, right? You run the Monastery Live interview show, and then you also run Geek Watch. Yeah, there's a couple There's a couple side projects as well. Um, the Parliament of Geeks, which is mostly talking about various anime. And um, Valley of the Judge, which is a chapter-by-chapter -chapter deep dive of various tabletop RPG core books. What well, it's, it's I've also talked with um, James Desbara, uh, Grim Jim. Do you know him? Yeah, I know him. I've had him on a few times. All right, so we uh, we want to jump in first a little bit, uh, talking about the Sweet Baby Ink stuff. So, hmm. do you want to tell people just sort of what your thoughts are on the situation so far? My audience, they are pretty caught up. Uh, I guess we can briefly, if you want to give a brief overview. Um, of how you see it, and then what you think are the big takeaways. So, I had heard about Sweet Baby Ink through through rumblings th regarding regarding various games that they had that they had worked on. Um, and when I when I saw that some of the people involved were boasting, my mindset was because look, my 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 friends call me Negro Damas for a reason that. They were get, they were going to keep pushing, and then they were going to do something stupid, and that was going to blow up in their face. And of course, right on cue, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League comes around comes around, and this was when I started seeing their name get dropped a whole lot more, to the point where it became a pejorative. And. Then I then of course I caught wind about the um, Steam group, and I predicted that they're gonna that they're that somebody's gonna do something stupid about that, and once again it's gonna backfire because this is always the pattern with people who are ideologically minded. They can they um can only ever see what's in front of them, and they can, and they have no sense of the consequences of their own actions at times. Especially since they're used to being able to blame it on something else all the time. There, I could go further into that, but I'm not a psychologist. It's just pattern recognition. I just knew that they were going to make a tremendous mistake, and it was going to cost them. And that mistake and that, was good. That that mistake that mistake was obvious was obviously obviously mess trying to get the thing shut down which is going to get a lot of people's attention like with the with the question of why why are you so gung ho about having this shut down just because it's reporting what games you're involved in you think you'd be able to put you'd want to put that shit on your resume right you you'd think that they would be proud of the work that they've done and therefore that they would would be like yeah absolutely we made this game we're not ashamed of it i don't know i don't know why they decided well, I do know why they decided to go the other route, but um, a really unfortunate decision on their part. It is what a certain investor for Hasbro would call an unforced error. So why do people call you Negro Damas? Well, do you remember the Negro Damas gag from Chappelle's show? I don't know. Um, that, that, that was, that was a, that was a, get, that was a sketch during that, during that whole show of this, of this one guy who kept predicting the future. And because I have had a habit of making certain predictions and then I end up being right, even if I'm not trying to pull some prophecy thing, just a feeling of where things are going based on the way, the way things have been leading up, um, and the fact that I keep getting I keep getting it right, that's what pro that's that along with me along with me be making way too many black jokes at my own expense and have and having them made at me, all in good fun of course. Um, the name kind of stuck. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on the way the media reported on 
the Sweet Baby Inc. controversy and the harassment of Cabrutus. So I knew I knew that they were going to react that way, and I think I think that my time because keep in mind this was this isn't the first internet movement that I've been a part of. A lifetime ago, I was involved in Project Chanology, and in being involved with Project Chanology, most mostly just going around the forums and ta and taking notes, and be and um coming close to being at one of the protests, but then I got sick and I couldn't make it. And if, if somebody if somebody's looking at this going, what the hell is Chanology? Look it up. It's a long story. I don't feel like summarizing it. <laughs> but I was able to I was a, I was able to understand patterns within within um, cults. And one of the big ones that's relevant to this and why the reaction from mainstreamers and, and the like to try and shut down SBI detected didn't surprise me is because of the fair game policy that the Church of Scientology had. Basically, basically that anyone who was critical of the organization, any and all means to silence them were allowable. Even if it meant, even if it meant fucking with government records as what happened with Operation Snow White years ago. So, so, so I knew I knew that because because of how it because of how people like this are are very insecure about the amount of authority that they have, any questioning of it has to be um, hunted down and metaphorically shot. Which is whether it be through isolation or through silencing, or in this case, both. So you you believe that the same sort of mind, mindset that guided the Church of Scientology and arguably still guides them, that this sort of if you don't agree with us, you're an enemy and everything is, I guess, fair game, as you say, um, that this sort of same mindset has taken hold with these games journalists and some other people in the industry, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I do, especially since. The, that whole. That whole coastal region thing is a bu is a bubble and a, a little club, and a lot of people in that have have um, talked themselves into believing either through other people or through themselves that being in that place makes them special, makes them above every Tom, Dick, and Jerry like you and me, and that be that belief is so cr is so much at the core. Of how they think, that anything that even questions that is treated as a threat to their person. The whole thing of someone conflating um, criticism of a particular belief system with criticism of a person. Would you say that, like the coastal region people are like this? Like, what do you what do you mean? Like, what's the best? Evidence. I'm using that as a catch-all for that mindset of like of like the bay the bay area mind the bay area folks especially around Los Angeles or the tri-state folks especially around New York or people who have that kind of um New York hipster at New York hipster or California hipster attitude you know ve a very a very bubbled off kind of kind of mindset with a lot of enablers. What and when it... you have <laughs> what? Go ahead. Do you finish your point? When you've got a when you've got a bunch of innate when you've got a bunch of enablers in that feedback loop, um these kind of things are inevitable. But like why why would we assume that like it's like, oh well it's because they like they have this like local culture. Like I understand like what you're like what you're trying to say basically is like these people who have like these super far left progressive on social issues values that you it, like view them it's as got the nothing issue. To do, it's got nothing to do with left or right in this case. It has everything to do with that with um them being it with the idea of the in group is the is the superior way of thinking and the out group is the inferior way of thinking. Well, I don't think that's like a hipster thing specifically. I was I was using hipster almost almost colloquially, but the but those two er, those two 
um, highly cosmopolitan areas are where are where this seems to be happening a lot. There, obviously, I'm not a psychologist. I'm I'm only go, I'm only going off of pattern recognition of what of what I've seen, and I do see that kind of insul insular mindset, especially since. How many? We've seen plenty of times where somebody has to just slightly disagree on something, and then they become public enemy number one. If you want a recent example, look at what happened with um, Gothics, and that, and the whole, and the whole BGG thi thing. Gothics. I'm not familiar with the controversy. If you want to lay it out real quick. Um, Gothics, who was who was a content creator, was the was um. The person who recently shared their story about their falling out with another consultancy group, Black Girl Gamers, the same one that's that tried to do that cease and desist to that park place, and by extension, John F. Trent, and um, have gotten the response of "Your claim is baseless. If you've got further things, you can speak to our representative." Oh, um, but she had, but she had told a very f a story that was very familiar to me. That being, um, ha having just just a slight deviation from the from the hive mind, and all of a sudden she's public enemy number one. She's persona non grata. So what did the black girl gamers, the company, the organization, what did they do to her? Um, it was it was a lot. It was a lot of a lot of isolation, a lot of name calling, a lot of Trying to trying to cut her off from the from um, social groups or social connections. This is the pattern I've seen before with uh, with other cult mindsets. Um, with Scientology, there was the whole thing of suppressive persons or SPs. You know, don't talk to that person. They're an they're an SP. You shouldn't be talking with them. You should be talking with these people who aren't. Oh, um, so I'm not saying it was go go ahead. No, I'm. I'm just. I just want to find out, like, what exactly all happened. Um, I'm trying my best to summarize, but there was a lot of things that did happen, and I don't want to. I don't. I don't. I don't want to try and do that story a disservice. Is what is what I'm saying. Okay, I did see like a little bit of this on my feed, but I haven't like looked into it because there's so many different stories going on. All right, so we have a couple mm -hmm. other stories here. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about what we'd go over, so I'll go ahead and screen share. Well, I can screen share on on here too for you if you want. Yeah, because I I've got two screens in front of me, but I but I can only do so much. So if you can if you can screen share screen share English monk on the on the call, that would be appreciated be. as well. All right. All right. So, this is a, a little bit of a long story, but we'll try and get through it quickly. All oh, right. God. It's... <laughs> so, Alyssa Mercante is the same Kotaku writer who wrote the original piece for Kotaku, the first m mainstream or gaming journalism outlet to talk about the Cabruta situation. Uh, it had already been covered mm -hmm. on tons and tons of live streams and YouTube channels and stuff, but no one in the games press had talked about it, uh, in an article at least, it seemed, until mm -hmm. her article came out. In which she doesn't even talk about the harassment of Cabrutus, which is a, a very strange oversight. It was later revealed, as everyone now knows, but I'll go over it for anyone who didn't, who's not caught up. Um, Mercante did, she interviewed Cod, a user of the Sweet Baby Inc. detected Discord server, and Cod provided her with evidence that that the this whole controversy started because of Cabrutus being harassed by Chris Chris Kindred at Sweet Baby Inc., an employee of theirs, and encouraging his Twitter followers to get Cabrutus and the Steam group banned from the platform, including Cabrutus losing access to all of his games. Um, so anyway, she, she's been involved in a lot of different controversies since then. So has Chris Kindred. They they seem to like like the attention, I guess. Um but this is Mark Kern. It's the, closest it's, thing, it's the closest thing that Kotaku's had to being relevant in years. So, well, we can talk about their whole new direction if you want. But so Mark Kern, um, he's a game developer. 
he's talked on a couple podcasts uh, about the situation, uh, and Mercante and him have like a friendly rivalry on Twitter. Uh, well, it's, it's it's more like he was kind of friendly with it, and she hates him, I think. Um, but I think I feel like it's I feel like it's more that Mark is is um not taking her seriously at all, and she and she um is she's not getting the she's not getting the feed that she wants and that's me and that's creating its own feedback loop yeah well, it, that's how i've always interpreted it cuz marks is cuz mark i've had i've had him on oh, my my channel a couple times and he and he's as much of a shit poster as the rest of us as everybody <laughs> more or less knows by this point yeah and um so mark and her have this ro- ongoing feud basically and apparently it's Mark is saying this is prior to this incident um, mm. because Mercante uses the Gamergate auto blocker. She's got like tons of people on Twitter blocked, including me, um, including Mark. And so she well, she blocked. So she had Mark blocked and then she unblocked Mark. And then she like tweeted at him or she just read his stuff and then she blocked him again and then she unblocked him again. Uh, mm-hmm. And they've had this whole running feud where they keep blocking and unblocking each other, or mostly just like her unblocking and blocking him it, again. And it, I haven't but, seen any instance of Mark blocking. Um, I don't know if he's blocked her at all, her. but she's blocked him several times and unblocked him several if, times. If I had to, if I had to give a bit of a guess as to what she's trying to do, she's trying to she's trying to fish. She's trying to fish for some gotcha that she can put in the headline of of a page on Kotaku. Um, and he and she's getting no bites. Probably, be, probably because her bit, probably because she's using bad bait. <laughs> uh, well, to, anyway, not to not to make a fishing joke, but April first rolls around. Um, Mr. Kern tweets out, "It is my pleasure to finally announce my wedding to Kotaku senior editor Alyssa Mercante. Everyone is invited. You know, save the date. It's got their photos." Uh, kind of a popular tweet, um, went kind of viral. Um, I think it's, I think it's funny. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think it's funny necessarily. I think it's just kind of weird. But like, it's, it's, it's weird and unexpected, and it's April Fools. And I don't think that it's like harassment, as some people are saying. It's a joke. Yeah, it's a joke <laughs> on April first. But I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like this is. She didn't, even, he didn't even tag her in it too. So it's not like she's getting thousands of notifications because of this. I'm uh, sure he, she'd love like, to get thousands of notifications. <laughs> and even if he did tag her, she could just untag herself um, on the platform. Yeah, I feel like if it's I, totally, if, totally cool. And if then, I, if I can be armchair psychologist, I'd imagine that what got her mad is the fact that she didn't get tagged. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to speak to that. But um, so then she tweets out, "Report this, please. Thank you." But I guess I. I don't know if she didn't realize it was April 1st um, cuz she then deletes the tweet. She she tweets this out and then deletes it. Yeah, and the then old she does tweet a follow up. She does three she does like four four or five follow up tweets. She then after deleting that tweet, she said puts she so is it so she deletes the tweet that she says encouraging people to block him or to report him. And then she tweets out save the date puts no date. So now she's like playing along into the joke because I guess she she found out it was a joke and now she's okay with it, um, and plays along with it. Okay, fair enough. But then she follows that up about an hour later um, with, "Yes, what is happening to me and other women on this app is misogyny. It's tired. It's old. It's boring. They're mad that I am comfortable in my sexuality, that I once made money off of it, that I'm openly queer and engaged to a man. So they do shit like this." She continues, they don't like that I clap back, that I post ass. It makes them angrier and angrier as they resort to lower and lower levels of misogyny. As a woman on the internet, I've been trained for this my entire life. Let's go. They want their women to be virtually silent, over-sexualized dolls and video games that they can jerk off to without having to wash their ass or clip their nails or show even a single attractive quality. Obviously, this app is owned by a man who did exactly the same thing to AOC. So no, I don't expect reports to do anything, but flooded anyway. So she does end it on her still encouraging 
people to report him, even though she later deleted the first tweet. All right, so what do you this think is... of her response? <laughs> oh, wait, she was serious. Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> That whole speech was so whole string doll. Like I could have heard that and I could have heard that from any um any politically addled per person over the last ten years. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, give me give me something original, will ya? But she does she does provide a perfect demonstration of the fact that you remember when I said earlier about the whole bubble thing? Yeah. A lot of people within that bubble are so insulated within it that people outside of that may as well be may as well be gray aliens to them. May as well be little green men. And I do I do my fair share of laughing, of course, but that's because I find I find the, I find the absurdity that she that she thinks everyone else thinks that much about her orientation or or do or doing sex work or what or whatever whatever be, whatever baggage there is most people don't care <laughs> yeah i i didn't know she was engaged to a man even i i i don't like i don't see like this wasn't even knowledge i possessed until earlier today reading this tweet mhm mm and if I had, if I had known about care. that tweet, I wouldn't I wouldn't care either. All I all I would do is ju is just play the small violin, but that's be that's because I like to see humor in things. And in the in this situation, when somebody's demanding to be taken seriously, the worst thing you can do to them is not. Especially since especially since if you're demanding to be taken seriously, then that's enough of a reason for me to not take you seriously. Well, she also mentions Mr. Musk and AOC in here. I don't know what this is referring to, but um and Prob probably but the, since prob it's going to be in the book, I should probably like do my due diligence and ask since I read it out loud. Um hmm. do you know anything about this? If I if I had to guess AOC made some hot take at one point and got checked. Oh, it's uh is it or, related to some recent phenomena? Uh, just all, all that I see it is is that is um you know how you know how the you know how um certain okay, people so, certain folks have so I've just pulled it up on, on here. Mm -hmm. So uh assuming this is what, what she's referring to, uh, there's a four days ago Alexander Ocasio Cortez and Elon Musk got into a spat on Twitter because um, Elon Musk tweeted out that, if this article's right, uh, they tweeted out that Democrats are seeking to import voters. And then she said, you're literally an immigrant. Uh, which is true. I saw Elon Musk himself is an immigrant. Anyway, that, I, but, you know, I, I guess that's what she's referring mm -hmm. to, but yeah, but but if I'm be if I'm being honest, I don't I don't have any reason to believe that 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 was being used by her not for anything other than the person I don't like is ba is bad. This also this person I also like is is bad. Therefore, th therefore both therefore both bad. All right. Do you have any other thoughts on that or on the AOC Musk situation? The AOC Musk situation is a nothing burger. Um. Especially, especially since you're, it's just, it's just an, it's just, um, politician number 451. I could, I could, um, I could interchange either of the, either of them. And of course, and of, of course, um, again, with, again, with the group, with the group, once one of them decides to get mad, Mad. Everybody else has to follow the herd, but as far but as far as as far as I'm concerned, the best thing the best thing I choose to do when it comes to that is just 
make is just make a whole joke out of it. Because if, if they're going to be if they're going to be acting like clowns, they could at the very least put the makeup on. All right, so you weren't you weren't too impressed with uh, Mercante's response, though she does nope. have some defenders. She does have some defenders. Uh, Ryan he's Easby. He's got stamps. Ryan Easby. He's uh he's another games journalist. He's written for game uh, PC Games in, and he also apparently does tabletop RPG stuff too. Uh, he tweets out. Mark Kern is now openly and aggressively harassing a journalist for doing her job. So I want it very publicly known that if you associate with him or agree with any of his ideals, you're simply not welcome in any gaming space worth a damn. He continues. He can pass off his bigotry, his misogyny as just an April Fool's joke, but people who aren't stupid know what it really is. What do you think of this? Um... I'm think I'm think I'm I feel like I'm looking at a chimpanzee p thumping his chest thinking that he's King Kong. Like a bunch of s I'm s I'm saying that I see more bark than I do, than I do bite and as as far as the whole the whole not welcome in any gaming space. Well, apparently I didn't get the memo. <laughs> but the but um all all that sound and fury amounts to nothing. Because, because th there's no, because if I'm not welcome in his sp in his space or whatever space he has authority of, fuck it, I'll just make, I'll just move somewhere else and make my own space. I've done it before. Well, and it, so. it's it's kind of weird though. Like he's trying to police who other people can interact with. Like, oh, you, if you associate with with him and with any of his ideas, you're not welcome in any gaming space worth a damn. That's, that's he thinks wild. his if work. You, he thinks if you his... even if you even associate with Mark, um, or agree with any of his ideas, you're not welcome. That's that seems pretty totalitarian. Well, remember remember what I said about SPs. You're see you're seeing exactly SP? That. SP suppressive person. The term that the term that okay yeah you was you used by okay, Scientology. Is, I've yeah I've I I've not heard that phrase before. You brought it up. But maybe it is used commonly. Oh, it's it got used a lot, especially when Miss Cabbage took over. Um. Oh, it's a Scientology thing. Yeah. I told you, stud studying dur during Chanology, I had plenty of time to study the patterns of the Church of Scientology and recognize those patterns and other things that aren't associated with that. But it's it's more of one studying the patterns so that you so that I can um, predict where the where that pattern is going to go next, and the and the whole thing of the simps um, trying to what trying to white knight for that for their milady, oh, um, that was the inevitable next step, and as far as as far as ease be. Oh, I'm I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be in the same space that he's in. Boo hoo! We don't even run in the same circles, anyways. And um, I do find it curious that he is that he was willing to tag all that other stuff, but when it comes to being a TTRPG writer, I've never heard of him. And this is my bread and butter, and I've never heard of him. Well, I should probably look it up now. Maybe he's. Ryan Easby tabletop. All right, the next question we'll go over, but I'll I just want to look it up real quick. Has he done anything published? Also, he works for Tech Raptor too in the past. It's kind of shocking, actually. He's written twelve articles for them. Yeah, none of them look interesting. If you act, if you want to. So wait, does he does he not publish any of his tabletop RPG stuff? If you want, if you want the best resource to um, look some look up if somebody's done anything in tabletop, the best spot to do it is through Board Game Geek. Actually, that's a pretty great website. I've used them before. That is basically the IMDb of tabletop gaming.
nothing. Well, it, well, they do. They they used to separate. I don't know if they still do their RPG stuff from their. So let's try one more time. Yeah. Unless he well, uses he says a pen he... name, maybe. But if that was the case, then why put it in his bio? Yeah, kind of. Oh well, you know, I'll I'll just take his word for it. Maybe he's made one or two things before in his life. Um. All right. I don't have any. I don't have any reason to, to take to take him at his take him at his word ab about it. I do. I end up seeing that he's do that he's done stuff for ver for various journalism sites. But in terms of in terms of in in terms of actually write in terms of actually writing for writing for tape for tabletop. One more thing I can uh, check, just so I can be like fair to him. You're gonna check if he's on Drive Through RPG. I seriously doubt it. No. Okay. All right. Well, I did. I did email him in in advance of this conversation. So if he if he's really offended that we think he's like a fake, or well, that, not that we think, but like hypothetically, someone could think that he's a fake RPG guy. He can send me the his his work via email, and I'll I'll include a reference to it in the book and stuff. Anyway, moving on. Um. So. Yeah. Another game developer, I've actually played this person's work, uh, Caroline Mar Marchal. According to Cabrutus, I could not find an archive of this, but Cabrutus took a screenshot um, of Caroline Marchal, who developed as Dusk Falls, which I've played, uh, and also Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls, which I've owned both those, but I'm currently playing through Heavy Rain, I guess, um, slowly. But she's also a GDC advisory board person. She's on the mm -hmm. advisory board, and she reported Mark Kern, this other game developer. Uh, unless the Cabrutus screenshot isn't real, because I couldn't find an archive. No matter, I tried, I tried searching on Archive.js and uh, just there, basically. And I also it added is, Cabrutus to send me a source. Yeah, it is very, it is very likely that she that um much like much like with Alyssa and with some of these other folk, pulled a um tweet and delete. Oh. Because that does seem to be a pattern that ends up ha ends up happening with a lot of these with a lot of these folk. I'm not read I'm not trying to read too much into that pattern. Um, but it's an it's another one. It's another if this is the if this is the case, and I I don't have a I don't have a reason I don't have enough of a reason to distrust um, Cabrutus. I I understand d due diligence and all that, but there wouldn't be enough of an incentive for him to play falsehoods. What I but as far as as far as that, I feel like the G, since the GDC is brought up in that particular tweet, I feel like the events of this year's GDC have significantly damaged its credibility. Oh. Uh, because it came, there were some, there were some decent talks, but so much of the attention was on talks that don't really matter to actual ga actual gameplay, and that infamous scream off is going to be memed to death for years to come. Yes, for context, uh, I'm glad you brought this up. For context, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, and for the book readers who almost certainly won't know if they're reading this decades from now, this year um, at GDC, they decided one person basically organized this scream off event. Um, they wanted to get a bunch of game developers and I guess other people who were just attending. Um, so people in the industry or people who were interested in the industry, mostly that they, they brought them all outside and they all screamed now, according to the person who organized this, there's two reasons for the scream. One of which was the there have been layoffs at some companies. And okay, that's you know what if people want to go scream because of that, I don't think that's a very good way to handle your stress necessarily. But do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, the second reason he wanted people to do it was because he wanted to stop Cabrutus and his army of evil misogynistic gamers from <laughs> from harassing people uh which is a, a wild thing that he, that this happened so he he says that he wants to stop gamergate 2 and so he's going to do a big scream to stop gamergate 2 now i think Too this, late what do you think of 
Well, I guess there's multiple components, but one, what do you think of the whole situation? And then we'll take it from there. Um, I've, I've seen the, I've seen these screaming slash screeching art performances, um, in cer in some circles over, over the last few years. If I'm be if I'm being honest, I think it says more about the people who engaged in this and thought that they were doing so thought that he were they were doing something or that it was some sort of release, some sort some sort of therapy, than it does about than it does about the people that they were claiming to fight against. Um You've probably heard this saying before. Better to be silent and let everyone think you're the fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. So and... why did? Oh, go ahead. Why did these people think that screaming is a good way to 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 relinquish their bad emotions or whatever? That I could that I couldn't tell you because I have no I have no clue my, myself. But no, regardless of reasons, it doesn't it doesn't um take away from the fact or dissuade away from the fact. That they're screaming in public with ca with um, people having cameras out wa filming it. Yeah, and to be clear, like this, this there were I don't know how many exactly, um, but like probably at least a hundred people who participated in this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like it was just this one guy. Though I don't know how many of the people involved necessarily knew. How, what the reasons for the scream were necessarily because I don't know how widely circulated that was. But what do you think? Even if him, it was just. What do you. Go ahead. You finish your point. Even if it was just five people, that's still five people that represent the GDC conference. So shit rolls downhill. Well, like if this was a private thing that they did, just these five people, and it wasn't like an officially sanctioned event, I wouldn't give a fuck. I mean, I don't give a fuck as it is. Like they're free individuals, they can do whatever they want. Um, but I don't think it like necessarily, it does look bad because that their attendees are like spineless cowards or some of them are right. Some of them are to be clear, not all, mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> it, it makes them look, it makes them look bad to some extent, but like it's, you know, it's free speech. So I think like, I don't think they should be banned from the conference because they made it look bad. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, anything. I wouldn't want them banned or, or anything like that. Um, I would I would just be I would be completely fine with them having to deal with the humiliation of that getting brought up any t any time a, f a prospective employer looks at their resume and sees that. Yeah. Now, what do you think of there being the two different motives though for the scream? The first one being the layoffs. I'm more sympathetic towards that. I think. Uh, the second one being this fake. Cabrutus is an evil misogynist <laughs> thing. Like I don't know. It seems kind of unhinged. Um, well, but, that's because it is. Yeah, it is unhinged. But like, what, what were... do you think of the, what do you think of the first one? Like, if they were just like, if someone was there, like, hey, look, I'm gonna do it because I lost my job and I'm pissed off and I want to let off some steam. Like, um, like in the you know this this person, she decides or he decides to just to scream to you know. It, to participate like i don't think that that's like oh my god this is a horrible person they're a laughing stock in all of society now i don't think that that should be the case necessarily but if they're if they're I doing don't... it for the second reason though <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason that they're doing it at the end of the day they're still screaming in pu they're still screaming in public uh, and do, when it comes to the layoffs thing yeah i do i do have my sympathies but at the end of the day, the choice to scream in public was your own damn choice. Is is where is where I'm at, and it's for the, you. You had th you had clearly put some degree of thought and planning into this, and not thought about. I'm screaming in public. People are going to be walking by as I'm screaming in public, and people are and people are going to be filming. That I'm screaming in public. Well, That's... Some, some people don't care, though. Yeah. Oh, I'm reminded of I'm reminded of a line from Yahtzee. It's like sticking your dick in a bowl of pudding. It could be the nicest, tastiest, most delicious pudding ever, but no one's gonna eat it because you stuck your dick in it. 
All right. So uh, Mr. Grums, Mark Kern, he responds mm-hmm. to Easy, Ryan Easby and says, I invite Ryan Easby to reply with specific examples to back up his baseless accusations of harassment. I'll keep a file and note if you do not reply with any evidence to your spurious claims. He then replies, or Mark then follows up later on with, um, or separately, I don't know. If, yeah, just separately. Um, with yesterday, a Kotaku reporter called for people to report my account for my April Fool's joke and get me canceled for it, just like they tried with Cabrutus Rambo. They tried to create a story in community notes painting me as a harasser and failed because it is another lie. Official GDC board is complicit as one of their directors directly joined in the cancel cancel pig campaign. I really don't like talking about this reporter, but if someone would collect all of her tweets about me, I think it would be clear that she has been stalking my feed, unfollowing, following, or following, unfollowing, blocking, unblocking, but now she's actively trying to cancel me. And then this one also blew up and became a massive tweet as well. What do you think of the, these developments? Um, I do think I think I think that he has if he if he feels that he's be, that um that some sort of coordinated attack is set, is set up against him he has every right to respond to respond as he sees fit. Um, I do. Especially, especially if um, even even if even if some even if um he doesn't try and go through the lawyers, just have just having it out there and out some sort of um some sort some sort of repository of of all of the um attempts that she's that she's tried to do to bait to create some bait. Oh, um, I think it's the last thing that any of those people kind of kind of want because I don't. I'd imagine the re- I'd imagine the reason why there's or one of the reasons why there's this visceral reaction has to do with the fact that it's that not that it not that it's there but that it's in a in, in a very convenient package because a lot a lot of people had known about the fact that Sweet Baby Inc was doing consulting work for a bunch of different projects but the SBI detected Steam Group was de- was demonstrating a spot where someone could easily look up whether a game is associated with SBI or not it's that it's that ease and that and therefore more people being aware of it that i think so, i think some of that crowd have a problem with cuz you remember in the you remember when it came to the first GG um, incident. The the articles about gamers being over only happened after that expose of, of someone um get getting good getting good getting reviews by sleeping around. Oh yeah, you're a review guy. <laughs> oh no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be nobody's gonna be. No, if, I'll, I'll if, roast uh, you. I'll roast you. <laughs> what, what? Which review? Um, the whole, the whole, the whole, Zo- the whole Zoe thing and the five guys and all that. That's what I'm referring to. Which of that drops? Which, which of her games, though? <laughs> Depression Quest. Okay. Well, what 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 rating did he give it? Like, was it out of like a five or a ten or? I have no, I have no idea. <laughs> he didn't review her game, but he did he did promote uh, he did promote her work, and yeah. also quote her extensively in a well semi I wouldn't say like he quoted her um, and got her side of the story for the Polaris Game Jam mm-hmm. uh, when he didn't disclose his conflict of interest with her, and he also promoted Depression Quest over forty nine other games, even though he was actually working on another game with her at the time. And uh, they were close friends. Mm-mm. Yeah, I got some. I got. I mixed. I messed up some of the details. But the important thing is, after that expose drops, then you then you see all the stuff that tries to suppress it. 
you know, with the whole gamers don't have to be your audience thing. <sighs> All right. So last story before we get to the book interview, uh, the rest of the book interview, I guess. But um, Niche Gamer tweeted out, while we do agree with the base sentiment of gaming companies, quote, overplaying their hands, unquote, per se, unfortunately, we can't cover this particular story or more stories like it without potentially getting punished by the PR firms hired by those same game companies who we have to rely on to get access to video games for review coverage and purposes. Recoverage purposes, ranging from smaller devs to mid-sized operations to even AAA gaming companies slash publishers alike. Because a lot of those same PR people support the people who hold these similar views, like what Elon is referring to here, we're already having significant issues experiencing roadblocks getting regarding getting access to AAA titles because we have covered the Sweet Baby Ink stories alone. It's quite unfortunate. They then followed it up with, we made this post last night because we're fed up of the status quo to anyone saying we're, quote, bending the knee, unquote. This post is to say you're not. Uh, we're not. Making that post will already irritate the people causing us issues, and it's time we stopped placating them. We're committed to free spe free expression and enthusiast press. That means we want people to make and play the games they want to play, and we want to share the new share the news you care about. That's what we stand for, and that's what we're going to do. So, real quick, Cabrutus actually did respond to this and talk about it. He he says that they was he's grateful that Niche Gamer provided him with good honest coverage in the past in the situation. Uh, and he he's on he thinks it's unfortunate they're bending the knee, but he also he says on a video on his channel uh, the GamerGate two weekly recap he calls it uh, <laughs> um, he he says that uh, he wants people to create an atmosphere around I guess the gaming industry and games journalism industry where niche gamer feels comfortable covering the stories that they want he's trying to play nice guy to them uh, I'm not so nice. I replied with, if you want to be a journalist, even a games journalist, you need to operate independently. Your job is to inform the public and hold the powerful to account. If you can't do that, you should find a new career. If you're too afraid to tell the story, DM me and perhaps I will. So I do sympathize with with Niche Gamer on on this to an extent. I mean, they're they're in the proverbial rock and a hard place. Because there's plenty of stuff that they pro that they probably want to speak about, but because of that very almost incestuous nature of of that of that particular branch of the industry, they're not they're not able to. I consider my I consider myself fortunate in the fact that I am mainly covering indies when it comes to the tabletop coverage that I do. Meaning it's a lot of small teams, in some case, in some cases, one man teams. So I don't really have that whole that whole. Oh, you've got to go with my, P you got to go with the PR firm or something like that. No, I just go with somebody directly. That's an advantage that I have. That's unique. Um, that being that being said, I do think that the I do think that um, the people who are throwing you're bending the knee kind of thing are being a little bit too reflexive when it comes to throwing that accusation around and I'd caution against it because cavalierly throwing any sort of accusation around is a good way for said accusation to lose its impact. I We've, mean like that is oh, what happened though, right? Like uh, yeah. objectively, right? They received assuming they're telling the truth, they received pressure from unsighted anonymous game companies that they need to stop covering controversial stories. And what they did in response to this was say, okay, we'll stop covering them. Please keep sending us the review copies. Right. I mean, like objectively, those, that is the series of events that transpired. Yes. Yeah. Objectively it is. What I'm saying is 
it's a it's a rock and a hard place for them because obviously if they don't get that kind of access, then that limits the kind of articles that they can they can show, and the and thus um that's going to affect the bottom line. So it's a so, and I I say it's the reason why I'm taking the approach that I'm doing is I is I want to illustrate that it's that that um that bu- that bubble that everybody's glad handing everybody mindset within that industry is um is the is in my opinion the bigger problem the um, it's just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time with it all right anything else you want to say about the recent developments um, that have been going on there's also something with IGN apparently and the black girl gamer controversy black girl gamers organization controversy um so i've not looked into like those two specifics yet um maybe it's um, point, but anything else you want to go over or talk about before we get into the book interview with the rest of it yeah with i'll go over it briefly because i don't want to dwell too much on it when it comes to ign this is less with ign and more with their um french division so keep in mind there's there's language barrier so so a grain of salt because obviously i don't speak french <laughs> But they made they made some remarks about ste- about um the upcoming Stellar Blade and how and specifically how in their in their view the desi- the the creator of the game or the or the character designer had never seen a woman you know it's it's that argument again and a lot of people have been clowning on them by show by showing the actual head of the company and the, and. How that how that whole thing kind of falls in on its face. Um, oh, I didn't know as... about this one. I, there are two other IGN controversies going on right now too. I, I was referring to one of those actually, but <laughs> the and as far as the Black Girl Gamers thing, um, Gothics was a member of was a member of that of that group. She told her story to John F. Trent. Who's who's working with that park place these days? He put up that he put up an article. BGG gets really pissed, say, saying that it's blatant misinformation and all of that. Then set then has a cease and desist letter sent out, and that park place retained ru- returned um. Geez, why is why is his name escape why is his name escaping me? But he they retained a a lawyer that they've had on. Um, plenty of times to represent them, and the official response that that was given was this: that the claims in the claims in your C and D are completely meritless. If you if you have any further if you have any further communication you wish to do with that park place, you do it through us. Basically, pound, go pound sand or talk to my lawyer. And I know that in that C and D they cl- they claim that they're going to that if if um it's not complied to by Friday that they that they are going to pursue legal action. I don't think they're going to do that because if they pursue legal action, um, I'm pretty sure that a um, at first I thought that they were going to try that they try and get it to be done in UK court, but. No, but th- there's no way that it happens since that park place is, in, is headquartered in America. The article was written in America, so that's where it's going to happen. So who filed but the, the big... cease and desist against who? Just real quick. Um, the CEO of Black Girl Gamers filed a cease and desist against that park place. For and, basically and gen- reporting on the situation. Yes. Okay. All right. And that park place responded with pound sand. Especially since some of the claims that were some of the claims that were made were ones that I guess I guess Black Girl Gamers wants to try and do a defamation claim, but <laughs> it's kind of hard to prove that when you're a lim- when by all accounts you'd be a limited public figure in this instance. But the big reason why I don't think this is going to go to court is discovery, because there's been a whole thing. Over the last few weeks, of people trying to figure out where consultancy firms like Black Girl Gamers and Sweet Baby Inc. are getting their money, 
which has resulted in a bit of a rabbit hole that involves several um, government offices in the U.S. and in Canada. As well as well as that as well as that one group that apparently was what apparently had some government ties as well. It's it's a that is a complicated af affair, and like like I said, I don't want to do it a disservice, but the thing the thing is is that is that in trying in trying to pull that kind of that kind of suit. It's once again falling into that pattern of people want people desperately wanting this kind of thing to be to be ended quickly and aren't seeing the bigger picture when it comes to what actions they take because that lawsuit is go if a lawsuit happens it's going to have a um snowball effect going down the hill like ev every dis every action that People have tried to make against Cabrutus, against Mar against Mark Kern, now against that Park Place. That's just making the problem worse for them. This is this is not going to go away over a weekend. We've crossed that threshold. That's my thought. That's my thoughts on that. All right, <clears throat> Mildra, tell me about your Gamergate experience. So. Like I said before, like I said before, this was not my first rodeo when it came to online movements, whether it be through Chanology or through the neo atheist movement. I've been in, I've been involved in these kind of things, even if not the most direct forms. Like I wasn't I wasn't doing YouTube videos on Scientology or anything like that, but keeping an eye on things and get engaging with with pe with people discussing it, I've done plenty of that now my my introduction to gamergate it mostly it mostly started with the fallout from the tropes videos and when i start when i started doing research on this anita woman which as as an aside anita is the diminutive version of anna which is um a bit of life imitating art But I I remember one of the first videos I saw was was called Anita Sarkeesian, the college graduate, which was going on going on the idea that the way that she was communicating is the is the way a recent college grad would communicate, and eventually one one thing led to another. I find out I find out about the Five Guys stuff and and everything else. And I re I realize at that point this is going to become a happening. Then the then the protests happen. Then GG happens. Then I I make some comments here and there. I get invited onto a onto a um live stream dis live stream discussion. I ended up enjoying it. Had did some more with that, and everything just kind of spiraled out. Um, but. While I'd say I'd say the culmination for me was the meetup that happened in LA. It was fortuitous timing because I was already going to be in LA for um, E3 that year. And truth be told, if I if the chance ever comes, I'm not going back to LA again because <laughs> the because the traffic is worse than everybody told me it was going to be. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about the meetups um, later on. Mm -hmm. So when you say recent college graduate speaks, like what do you mean? There's a there's a certain it has to do with the with the verbiage, the wording that she you, that she utilized in trying in trying to come off as academic. Um, the for lack of a better term, the college know it all. The person who believe who believes that they that because they went to college that they know the life know about life universe and everything. What didn't you um, like about her videos? Um, 
Aside from aside from the fa aside from the fact that she got a lot of stuff blatantly wrong for what I was told was a academic presentation. If that was an academic presentation, I'm sure sure Wolfgang Pauli would have a field day with that. Uh, if you don't know, Wolfgang Pauli was a physicist who was infamous for his colorful takedowns of sloppy science. Oh, one of one of the big. But if, but for me personally, I remember one of the big problems I had was, and not to find a point, all show, no go. Placing, so, placing so much of an emphasis on the pre, on the presentation of just the just the wording of things, in a very purple prose manner, and purple prose. Is which I'm assuming you're familiar with that phrase purple is something prose? that will always tip. Yeah, purple prose. Oh, um, for those unaware, it's it's um when writing it, it's when writing is so obtuse with its descriptiveness that that up uh, that that long uh, that long obtuseness calls attention to itself. Like imagine someone spending two paragraphs just describing that the curtains are blue. When they could have just said, the, "Those are blue curtains." That's one way to look at purple prose, and it felt it felt more like it it felt more like it was an attempt for her to showcase how intelligent she thought she was over no, over to, over topics that it was cle it was clear to me that she. Did not ha did not have a full understanding of. Which ones did she struggle with, or did she get wrong? Um, it's it's hard. For, it's keep in, keep in mind. I haven't looked at any of those videos in years, so it's going to be hard for me to pin down any one any one entry. The I do I do remember the damsel in distress video. What was the one that struck a particular chord? Because because of because of the fact that it try. I'm um, keep in mind keep in mind again. I haven't seen them in a long time, but it had to it had to do with this with this idea of looking at the notion of self sacrifice, a common trait in heroic fiction, as some as some sort of set some sort of setup or the, or some sort of Exchange and good, good. <laughs> and the the idea of of um of media convi media conveying values is was one of those things that was um technically correct but still wrong. Um, plus, I do remember around that time I was having heavy amounts of debates about Death of the Author, which I'm not a... Death of the Author, as far as a literary concept, I'm not a fan of. No, why not? Or rather... Well... <sighs> the, re the reason why I'm not a fan of Death of the Author, that idea that the that the... The author's intent is on no higher of a pedestal than anyone else's interpretation. Is that it's an open field to be? It can be an open field to be used by bad actors to say that their particular interpretation is of merit. So why did you get involved with Gamergood? Um. <sighs> I love games. I love games in all, in all forms. And I I um for for me I didn't I didn't want get I didn't want games to be I don't like I I don't want games to be some, to be something where where entertainment becomes secondary. Um, is the 
some somebody had asked me would would I have a would I have a problem if it was a if um if a game was subverted to be a bunch of right wing propaganda and I'd say yes, but not for the reasons you're probably thinking. It's because I feel that a, I feel that any game that's being designed, the designer should be gung ho on making the most enter, the most entertaining experience that they can, and having to also adhere to some ideal political mindset is a distraction from that. Are I feel games, that it's important. Go ahead. Are the games being sub subverted with left-wing political agendas now? I would I would say this I would say the attempt is cert is certainly there or for pe or for people to come along who th who think that they know better that they have the answers and just in ge just in general I've never been a fan of people who think that they ha that they have the solution b and, and their only source is just trust me bro What are some examples of this happening in games um, I'll give. Do you mind if I give one from the from the world of tabletop gaming? Sure. Though I so, would want a video game one later after, but yes. Well, Keaton, tabletop gaming is an area of expertise for me, but it's more accurate to say that that my area of expertise is tabletop gaming at the crossroads of all manner of culture. You can just use which a is, tabletop one if you don't have a video game one, I guess. Now, I've been I've been a fan of I've been a fan of Legend of the Five Rings for the longest time, and for the past fifteen years, one particular thing I've ha I've had to hear from a lot of people is ha is how it needs to fit it needs to fix its problem its problematic elements because it is because it's not a accurate portrayal of historical Japan. Which would be a fair argument to make if that was ever the intent. Legend of the Five Rings is a card game and a TTRPG that's been around for a long time. That takes place in the in, a, in its own setting called Rokugan, with its own culture, its own factions, its own, its own its own political relationships, and so on. It is its own world. It would it would be about as ridiculous as expecting Middle Earth to reflect um, Western Europe in, say, the 13th century. But it's it's more that it's more that somebody comes. What I don't like is when somebody comes in clearly has clearly has no knowledge of what they're stepping into, and acts like they do. Um. In, in um, vid, if I have to use a vid, if I have to use a video game example, um, I suppose I'll I suppose I'll bring up Ghost of Tsushima. I had a bunch of people who got butt mad over the over um a couple of non-Japanese developers, um, spending that much spending that much time with that particular region, or the um got or the guy that that was playing. It's it's not a um, it's not a it's not a by I can't remember what that instrument was, but they were but they were mad because he wasn't Japanese enough, even though he's he's one of the few people who knows how to play that instrument in the world. Oh, because it's a it's a very difficult wind instrument from what from what I recall. The pattern he the pattern here is once again people. Acting like it's their God-given duty to fix things. Can you can you define what Gamergate was? I don't think I don't think you'll ever be able to 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 pin it down to one definition that you could find in an Oxford dictionary. It like a lot of movements. It was a lot of things to a lot of people. For some, it was a Sticking it to the to the um to to that to that social to that social justice collectivist um attitude that had been festooning. For others, it was trying to trying to protect um 
the ga the games that they happen they happen to enjoy. For others, it was it was the whole um, ethics thing. But what it ultimately was was a was a um, successful to some to some extent consumer revolt. Do you and good? Good. I think that I think that any I think that any attempt to try and pin it down to a sentence or something like that is never going to be able to capture the whole of it because when you have that many people, you they come into it through different means and different reasons. Do you consider yourself a gamer? What does that mean to you? Being a, I I. Being a gamer to me means it means a love for for games in all in all its forms. To to the point where that becomes a a significant, um, ho a significant hobby, pastime, what have you. Um, and I I say it that way to differentiate it from, say, somebody who plays a cell phone game in. On the on the side, it's not enough to just to just play games to be a gamer. You have to be playing games, talking about them, watching uh, watching other media about watching other media about it. Um, engage and more importantly, engaging in the engaging um, in a healthy way within a, within the community of a given game or games. That I feel is the is the dividing line between a gamer. And someone who just happens to play games. Is that a gendered term for you? No. On August twenty eighth, twenty fourteen, ten competing publications or ten competing outlets all published articles in the same day. These ten articles were followed by nine additional articles on other mostly gaming sites over the next few days, which some saw as calling for an end to the gamer identity. What did you think of these articles? I thought I thought it was a massive mistake. If they there's a concept in sports called the dam of legitimacy. The dam of legitimacy is the is this idea that the sanctioning body of a given sport, whether that be the NFL for football, whether it be the FIA for Formula One and a bunch of motorsports all over the world, whether whether it be whether it be um, the NBA for bas for basketball, what have you, that there is a degree of fairness in the officiating, and if you if that dam gets damaged, it can call it can be catastrophic if not taken care of because if people don't believe that anybody could win at any at any given time, in the in theory, if not in practice. Then there's far less of an in, of an incentive to jo to jo to join in and engage with that given sport. Oh. and where and where this ties into that that set of articles is, I think for a lot of people, there was the idea that that you could, that you could have some degree of trust when it came to when it came to certain publications some of that some of that trust was certainly waning if if only because of years upon years of bad of bad articles i mean the the um whole th the whole thing of mocking like i like ign started long before all this happened but by putting in those articles in the in the because because I'd say all all of them were in the span of less than a week. Um, it cre it ended up significantly damaging that dam of legitimacy, and could very easily put the image in someone's mind of the bo of the boys club mentality. And I when I say boys club, I do not mean that in a gendered sense. Um. Bo I'm referring to that kind of it, that sort of inner circle, um, country club kind of mindset. Boys club is just what it's nicknamed in si when it comes to the management of some teams in professional hockey. So why do you think they wrote these articles? 
you remember what I said earlier about about trying to stamp out any any questioning of a, of a perceived of a perceived authority or or a perceived status? Yeah. I look at those articles as another as another case of that. Oh, uh, especially especially given how the hive mind tends to operate, because we see because even now we see a repetition of that. You know, somebody feels that they're attacked, and then all of the other people within the hive mind des decide to dogpile on whoever was doing the attacking. If the games press tried to reform, or even just ignored ethical questions, instead of publishing these articles, do you think that Gamergate still would have blown up into a massive controversy? If... If the these if um if this sort of thing had been dropped on my lap that's that somebody that um somebody was do, was doing this kind of thing the first thing that I would be the the smart thing would be to publicly disav publicly disavow from anyone involved with that conflict of interest because that kind of public conflict of interest is a would be a very good way to damage um credibility and the way i see it and keep keep in mind i've i'm i'm a layman i've never i never studied journalism the fact the fact that i have jokingly said that i'm a better journalist than some than some people who claim to be journalists is a joke <laughs> but i but i understand that credibility is incredibly important when you're when you're putting yourself out there as some form of journalist or even some sort of expert if you need an example of of how the of how um, a little crack in credibility can go can kill somebody not figuratively speaking of course um look at say Todd Rogers or Billy Mitchell Guys who may have been may have held a degree of respect for the, for their pioneers when it comes to the whole high score race in the early days of gaming, but because a lot of that has come under scrutiny and and the actions of of a few of them, they're looked at like jokes these days, like a like a running like a running running joke, and. When you when you lose th when you lose that kind of credibility, it's very very difficult to get that back to get back that level of audience trust, and the audience is at the end of at the end of the day instrumental. Like you're not you're not making money if nobody's reading your shit, and look at. Look at what happened with Giant Bomb, for instance. After the whole that whole fallout, because Jeff Gesterman wouldn't speak highly about Kane and Lynch too, Giant Bomb was never the same. Well, that was Gamespot. He then he went on Game to Spot. found yeah, Game Giant Spot. Bomb after that. But yeah, I got things crosswired. But Gamespot eventually recovered. But I'd I'd say I'd say they recovered. But for the longest time, they were. Oh, they were down in the dumps. I'm not saying that that killed GameSpot, but it definitely damaged it. And it took it took them a few years to recover. I'd I'd say they're in a much better position now, but I'd say it's more to do more to do with um st with stuff that they're doing on YouTube like Loadout or especially the um, gun expert videos that they do with um, Craig Ferguson. Where he's just, where he's just breaking down and giving his thoughts on fi on firearms in various video games. Some some of them causing him more pain than others, <laughs> but the but it's but it's hard to, it's hard to get back that le that level of trust that level of trust, um, and. Hell, if we, if we have to use another example as as far as trying to regain trust, I'd say the the saga of um, Final Fantasy XIV is a good example. You know, the vanilla version being an absolute mess, 
then the, then um Yoshi P does that grand apology tour regarding the whole thing puts the thing offline then it gets rebooted as a realm reborn and because of the open nature that Yoshi P has had he's he's been able to win he was able to win the trust back with that game yeah I think he's great and actually it, it, he didn't just take the original offline um <clears throat> No, he blew it the fuck up. Well, he well he did. Yes, true. But he, they, as they were, as they were, because they owned up to their mistakes. Yoshi P did. They and he went in and they made the whole new game from scratch, almost basically. But as they were doing that, they also gave updates and tried to make the original game better for the people who were still playing it. Uh, as mm-hmm. they did so, um, before they blew up the old game. Which I I, yeah. I, I think Yoshi P's story. I think that that's how companies should operate. I think that you'll you'll actually gain. Like I'm actually that same story. I get Yoshi P is great. He's I I think that he's a he's a great example of what the gaming industry, how these how these people who run these games, who are who are executives, they should be thinking about these sorts of things. They should be placing a high degree of emphasis on their credibility, essentially. Um, and one there, of the main issues our our society that we see that I see at least yeah. is is a lack of integrity. There was a there was a quote there was a um quote that was. Up that was up on the wall at one of the places I worked when I was like when I was like eighteen. Um, it did it didn't give a source to this quote. I've I've seen some say that Chuck Yeager said it, but I don't have any way to say that was the case. So grain of salt. It takes years to gain a customer. It takes seconds to lose one. And when I when I look at the way that's the way some companies take their audience for granted. A, a question that's been at the back of my mind throughout it is what would happen if any other fi- any other consumer field were to take this attitude imagine it, imagine if say um at, say I don't, I don't know st- I don't know staples or something would would say off try and say office workers aren't our audience and actually, now that I think about it, I do have an example of, of what happens when a when a cus, when a um, company tries to does something that pisses off their consumer base outside of video games, and that was the whole IHOP trying to trying to convert to doing burgers instead of breakfast. That lasted all of two months before they before they walked back before they walked it back because. <laughs> Because they managed to piss off everybody with that move. With that move. Why do you think the Games Press didn't just go that route? Why not just say, "Hey, look, we made some mistakes. We're going to do better," and then everybody just Pro- goes home? Probably, probably because, like, probably because in in their in their mind, they think that they know better. In the in their mind, they again they view themselves as above the mere plebeians that they're in and that they're in an ivory tower, and everyone around and everyone around them is const, is constantly saying no you're no you're great you're great you're not you're not doing anything wrong and there's no, there there's nobody in there's nobody who's able to be in that um particular crowd who's who's like no, this is fucking stupid. We need to, we need we need to stop being fucking stupid. All right. Mildra. Oh, mm-hmm. We have about 100 more questions. That's like 70 more questions to go. So, I'll try and get through <laughs> it relatively quick cuz I do have to work in the morning. Um but if we if we have to do a second stream sometime and finish it, that's that's okay with me too. Yeah. Uh what do you think what did you think of games journalism in 2014, and what do you think of it now? In twenty in 2014, I was already le- I was already leaning further away from the bigger journalism sites and more towards um, smaller scale or more ind- or more independent stuff. This was where I found places like this. I was already skewing towards places like Silicon Era, places like Gematsu, play. Places like um, Dual Shockers for a time, 
and in the in those kind of places you had you had the same that same that same small that same small gr group of garage band attitudes that I that I used to see reading through Game Fan when I was a kid. And I had I had stated that 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 um those particular personality driven types of journalism is where is where the wind is going to be blowing. And I I'd like to say that in the years since I've mo I've more or less been pr more or less been proven right. Um Obviously, obviously, there's the YouTuber factor, but th but people can be YouTubers and journalists. Um, well, journalism's in action, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see we've seen a significant rise of more citizen-style journalists because across the board, journalism is not treated in high, in high regard as it once was. Because. Because of the fact that you either have rags that do nothing but talk about gossip, or you have the more malicious affairs like what we've been talking about. So, was journalism better in the past, or? I think it. I think it was. Um. In the. I think in the. In the early. In the early two thousands. There were certain there are certainly problems, especially on the reviewer end of things. Um, oh, I'm not talking about games journalism. I'm talking about like real life journalism. Um, I would I would say yes, and I distinct and um, part of part of it is part of it is the fact that there's the focus of you are you are here to get the story and get it out there. As opposed to you are here to tell your story. I'd re I'd lamented at one point that a lot of quote unquote journalists felt like poor man's bloggers. Has games journalism gotten better? On the bigger end of things, not re not really. Like when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the self when it comes to the self proclaimed um, big names the it has it has not it seemed to have died down for a for a bit and um, if I can make a prediction it's going to get it's going to get worse for them because the after the pandemic most of the venture capital money has been has been drying up and it's been a very dark winter. For a lot of enthusiast press, simply because the money, the money for the kind of rage bait articles that they were writing or the listicles that they were writing just isn't there anymore. What and kind of what kind of reforms would you like to have seen happen? I think it's. I think. I think you have I think having some having some sort of um ethics ethics based oversight is, cer is certainly one, is certainly one avenue. Um a lot a lot of this stuff has been gotten away with beca because journalism ha has had this attitude of being this wild west especially online journalism. And I think I think that I think that um have being be, being more thorough in terms of in terms of who gets in terms of who gets hired and looking at people's be, looking at people's backgrounds primarily to scan for who's be, who's being an activist is would be important the other thing that would be important is something that some sites have been trying to do but it hasn't. But it was done too late, and that is making it a mandate of stick to of stick to the subject matter. There was that whole thing when Deadspin, when a bunch of people were mad at um, Deadspin because the higher up said stick to sports. Of course, then they didn't. Then they end up getting end up getting sued, and now Deadspin is no more. Oh. You, we saw this recently with Kot with um, Kotak. With the Kotaku staff not being happy about 
right about the fact that the higher ups want them to write more guides than the activist leaning articles that they've been doing. Well, like they wanted them to basically get out of journalism altogether, essentially. Aside from guides for the most part. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I'm, I can I'm not good. I can understand why since um since guides have been very lucrative for those who have who have pursued that. So I can understand the mind the mindset there. Um I don't even if the I don't even think the fact that they said get out of journalism or focus on guides even even played a factor into their reaction. It was that they were being told um what the what that they couldn't do what they wanted. I'm seeing a lot of child mentality within them. Well, the I, think, it, I think part of the reason they well for, I I don't have a problem with them doing journalism if they actually do journalism. Unfortunately, uh, they're not doing cases, journalism. They're yeah, blogging. Well, they're, I don't even care if they blog. I don't. I just want them to be honest. <laughs> uh, which unfortunately they're not. Um, so I don't, I don't think have a problem with them wanting to do journalism. I think that part of the reason that they were so angry too is because I think maybe, obviously we may never know because these are backroom conversations, but most likely they they were upset. The, the executives were like, why are these Kotaku writers bringing all this negative attention towards us with like the, the recent controversies? that they've been engaging in and the way that they're behaving on Twitter is highly unprofessional. Um, and I think that the executives were like, no, look, we don't want to deal with this anymore. It's not really making that much money anyway. We're going to shift to the guides. Um, and then I think the staff were like, oh no, um, right now, if you do it right now, it's, it's going to make, well, one, they don't want to do the guides, but two, they, they probably think it's going to be a bad look because everyone will know that they fucked up, but that's the reason that they got, because this happened shortly after the Sweet Bay Bank controversy, where they were basically called out for for lying in their article, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that they didn't want to have that <laughs> people draw the connection if there was one, or maybe it was right. a coincidence, right? It could be. I'd I'd imagine that I'd imagine that a good chunk of those folk think think that if they if they pivot over to guides, then that's going to be seen as a victory for who they consider their opponents that they look at like the devil. How responsive to calls for reform do you think the games press was? Non-existent. Because they don't think that they're doing... Because they, I believe in, I believe they in their mind think that they are doing absolutely nothing wrong and that it's everyone else who has the um, problem that needs to be corrected. What about the sites that did create ethics policies? I think those I think those ones will as long as they stick to it will be able to um main, will be able to maintain themselves. If you were the editor in chief of a gaming website and some of your employees were accused of ethical violations, how would you have handled the situation? I would have been hands-on with it. I'd I would have called. I would have called them to. I would have called if it's like two people who were involved. First, I'd find out who was involved. I'd call. I'd call them up and I'd say, "In my office right now, I'm not asking." <laughs> and said, "This is completely unacceptable." And both of you are going to be writing a. Both of you are going to be writing a letter of apology. That apology is going up. Is going up front page. If. I even smell anything like this happening again, you're out. And if I have to if I have to buy off whatever contract you have, I will spend that money to get to get you out and and make and make sh make sure that everybody knows I have that we have we do not endorse this kind of shit. Do you think there is still a role for good games journalism in the world? And if so, what does that look like to you? I think that there is. I think, and I think that there is, I think that there is a role in in various forms. However, I think that that I think that that is going to be leaning far more towards, um, in the far more towards independent stuff, as well as places that places that 
do not do not have that kind of mindset. Do not have that kind of bubble group think mindset. I do think I do think that the the easy the one of the first major steps that could be taken to de to deal with the to deal with the um ethics issue as far as as far as video game journalism is concerned is the bleeding out and and eventual death of the access model if you if if some if people are if people become more and more willing to just go fully independent with how, with how they do things and instead of talking with a PR firm talking with developers directly or de or development teams directly that will be a significant step forward i might be a little bit biased because that's more or less what i what i do when i when i've communicated with folks i don't go through a i don't go through a pr group i go to a developer directly uh, do you think there is still a role for good game stern actually i've i've talked with a lot of developers actually um uh, both some for the interviews and then some just anonymously um off the record and it's it's a lot of them are willing to talk you know they they want to have people um who they they can trust who will do a good job and protect their protect them they're not their mm -hmm. anonymity um and of course when people go on the record that's always great too <laughs> but you know, yeah a lot of game developers they'll tell you stories about what's happening which is which is great um you can just talk to them, reach out to them directly. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not saying you shouldn't contact like the corporate PR people too. Um, I do sometimes actually reach out to companies. They don't usually reply to people like me though. I've re I've resolved the fact that I'm a little bit too spicy for the PR mindset. Even though even though I go out of my way to be far more professional than some of the people who have credentials. Oh. But for me, but for me, my interest has been. I will. I'll. My interest is. My interest has has always been in one particular angle, and I should know this. This ties into why I um stop. Why I stopped. Tw why I stopped tweeting and the like regarding Gamergate because there was one side thing that was th that was in there. Um, rebuild initiative. The idea being showca showcase the games that showcase the games that aren't in this particular bubble, and that was where my interest lay because I was already because by that point I was already doing my channel and that channel was already focused on showcasing what else was out there besides the big two of D and D and Pathfinder in the tabletop gaming scene and doing things like my. Um, hangover shit show streams, which is all about showcasing indie games getting um making making the rounds at show floors and the like. And when I was at E3, that was where I spent more of my time with. I didn't spend my time in the EA booth or or any of the big developer booths, especially since I had heard horror stories about Bethesda and <laughs> some time before that. It was it was the one it was the one game booths or the smaller or the Except the double A or the indie stuff, that's where my focus was. And I, th I think the in, only large booth that I went to was Nintendo's. In September 2014, it was revealed that nearly 150 games journalists from competing publications were in a mailing group called Game Journal Pros. What did you think of this revelation? It was just more confirmation of what I was already thinking. I already had the mindset that there that there was a that there was a country club attitude and the email list did not surprise me. Some Gamergate supporters believe that pressuring advertisers to pull out would be a good way to convince gaming publications to initiate ethical reforms. What did you think of this strategy? I think it was a sound strategy at f at first. However, it's a strategy that had some unintended consequences. There's been certain dramas with various YouTubers over the last decade where an attempt to try and cancel somebody is to go after their sponsors. Yeah, 
you think that they were inspired by Gamergate's success? It's not uncommon for people to take the wrong lessons watching success from a distance. Or, th or think that there's a certain thing that is the, for lack of a better term, magic trick. Did you support contacting advertisers over ethical violations only or for other reasons or not at all? I support I supported I supported having discussions with with advertisers regarding it regarding it but anytime that I reached out I always reached out in a neutral way possible of showcasing the information that I ha that I had what I did not do is hey let's 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 use Coca-Cola as an ex as an example just pulling that out of a hat hey Coca-Cola did you did you know that your advertising is, associ is associated with this no, I never tried to use spooky language, is what I'm getting at. Do you have any thoughts on Deep Freeze? I thought Deep... I thought what Deep Freeze was trying to do, as far as having a repository for the, for, ver, for various individuals that, ha, that, ha, that had certain ethical violations that were um that were collected was a good way to get was a good way to get people the skinny onto the problem because it would be a, it's a lot easier to, to direct someone to a given website than it would be to have them go to a bunch of tweets or... and articles some folks crazy folks like you and me are willing to do the latter but i know that we're in the minority Right, we, and, have to, we have to vet all of Nathan Grayson's reviews of Depression Quest. Ha ha. I think there's a lot of value in, in, in something like that, in categorizing it all for, for to make it easier for the public. I, I think there's a lot of value there. That's what I'm doing with this book in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. In August 2015, Michael Koretsky, a regional director for the Society of Professional Journalists, hosted the SPJ Airplay Conference. The idea of the conference was to have journalistic ethics experts meet with Gamergate supporters to discuss their concerns about games journalism and the way the media covered Gamergate. The second half of the conference was interrupted by bomb threats, forcing the convention center to be evacuated. Do you have any thoughts on this event? I think that trying to come to a common ground was a wise move. I also think that the people who tried to do a bomb threat showed their ass. Because I had seen, by that point, I had seen this kind of thing before of, pe of people trying to do bomb threats or pull the fire alarm to disrupt conferences that they don't like. Um, in, doing so, in doing so, it's like that line from Game of Thrones. When you cut out a man's tongue, you're only telling people you fear what he has to say. I know I'm. I know that's not one to one, but I'm paraphrasing. Why do you think the media largely didn't cover SPJ Airplay? Um, because they had a they had a conclusion in mind, and they needed that conclusion. And when I say need, I mean I mean need it the way. And the way an addict needs their fix, they need they needed they needed um, their ideological opponents to be the worst of everything. You know that you know the whole oh they're all game they're all uh, misogynists they're all sexists they're all racists they're all right wingers they're all alt writers take your pick. Do you have any thoughts on other Gamergate panels like? the South by Southwest save point panel or my Gamergate panels at Arch Anime and Natsukon? I thought that having the panels was, was a smart move because, again, sunlight's the best disinfectant. That's as far as I can say because I've never been to South, South by Southwest or the majority of conventions. I only go to a few small-scale conventions because the smaller-scale ones are the ones I, ha I have more fun at. Any any you'd recommend? Um, a lot of the ones that I go to are within the are within the Midwest area. That's not that's not to say I don't that's not to say I'm not opposed to flying out. It's just 
at my at my height, flying is a special experience. One I don't like to do any more than I have to. I'm six six, so getting on a plane is a um, pain. But I've I've enjoyed. Obviously, I've I've been I've been to GenCon a few times. Um, not not as much after one incident, but that's another story. Um, I'm gonna be going to DaveCon later this later this month. I've been to Anime Detour a few times. I've been to Twin Cities Con once. I mostly stick around the lo the local ones. The there's not a very large convention scene. Um, where I am in Minnesota, so I try to I try to support the smaller ones as as I can, and I've met, I've met some interesting people in do, in doing that. Have you seen the Airplay documentary that came out? Oh, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, some hmm. people believed that Gamergate should have ended after Airplay. What did you think? No. And I know I know that everybody's doing the whole oh Gamergate is back or anything like that. In in truth truth be told, it never left. Because the effects of it did cause a paradigm shift in the way a lot of people with it within the gaming sphere were going to be approaching things. And the thing about paradigm shifts in that regard is that they never revert. This idea that that it should have ended after airplay, that's never how these things work. It's not. It's not like. Um, it's not like the fashion trends of the '80s suddenly stopped when 1990 comes around. What was the through line that you saw that would not go away? The destruction of trust between cons between the consumers in the space, the gamers, as it were, and. The, and the people who cl who claim to be um, writing on things that would be in their interest. Have you seen the Airplay documentary that came out recently? No. Do you plan on watching it? Uh, maybe, maybe, but it, but right now it's not high priority. Do you have any thoughts on the Kunkel Awards? I don't even know what that is. So, uh, after Airplay, Michael Koretsky uh, and Lynn Walsh at the Society of Professional Journalists created the Kunkel Awards, where they would uh, award, give these awards out to games journalists every year who did a good job, including independent people like YouTubers and stuff who investigated, who performed acts of journalism, uh, and try to promote positive uh, works and, and reward positive people doing a good job, basically, in the field. And behaving ethically um it lasted for five years then it got sort of merged into the the wider spj award ceremony so they they still do it but it's 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 just one award now i think and it's part of their main ceremony instead of a separate thing mm -hmm. um i'm pretty neutral on award ceremonies as a whole the the only remark i've ever made is is that if if i ever if I ever win in any or or something like that in tabletop, um, I'm going to use I'm going to use my my 30 seconds to to pull a Shane Douglas and th and throw down the trophy. <laughs> Do you think the Gamergate banner should have been used to take on gaming industry issues outside of just games journalism? No. Because I had seen what happened when when um, atheism plus happened, where a segment of the neo atheist movement wanted to try and use the banner to tackle other beliefs or add other things to it, that ends up diluting things. Um, you had a, you we saw a similar thing with the with the rise and fall of the Tea Party um, in U.S. politics. Regardless of what anyone th what anyone thought of them at the time, that's not that's not important. It's the it's the fact that originally it was about tax reform. 
that was that was that was the key issue at first. Then all these other issues and all and all this other religious aspects and and neoconservatism and all that started coming started coming in and adding to it and oh the people who agreed with every um aspect of that were became lesser and lesser and the whole thing fizzled out. If Gamergate was used as the was used as a banner for other contentious issues, it would dilute it. And the thing that can kill a movement is mo is a lack of momentum. So for you, was it just games journalism, or for me, it was ga for me it was games journalism and gaming culture. That w that is where I believe the focus. Should have be should have begun and ended. Trying to add in other stuff would have would have diluted things. It's important in that kind of thing to stay on damn target. Well, um, we can skip the next segment if you want, unless you consider it to be part of. Well, were you involved in the artistic freedom discussions, and did you consider that part of GamerGate or separate? I can I considered it separate. I only it was only in my opinion part of the discussion, be, just because of overlap. Like I like I said, I for me the focus was and should have always been ethics and journalism, and and um, and gaming culture. And in and for me it's for me the the gaming culture part is ensuring that the gaming culture is st is always about the games. That's why I have that's why I have that all about the games attitude on my cha on my channel and in whatever platform that I have a hand in. If somebody wants to do the politics stuff, they can do it on someone else's time. Um now obviously there's politics in your in your particular platform, but I don't engage with that. And I know I know th that if you were to ask me to get to give some statement about some political issue nowadays, I'd I'd say I choose to say nothing. <laughs> well, you can choose to say nothing in the next segment, okay? But I'm still gonna ask. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we're not there yet. Um, what do you think of arguments about video games causing or reinforcing real-world sexist attitudes? I look at it the same way I the same way I looked at the vit, um violent video games ha cor correlate to real world violence that was tr that so many pundits tried to push back in the 90s. It, it at best one might be able to one might be able to argue very 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 circumstantial evidence and when I when I say that I am stretching it so hard that it's like having Reed Richards from Fantastic Four drawn and quartered. Well, wouldn't wouldn't people say that games are a way of telling stories and making people feel things and experience things, including in ways that only games can do, and that these experiences can in some ways, influence the way human beings perceive and operate within the world. In a way, in, in to an extent, yes. Here's here's the fine print, though. A lot of times, when people when it comes to the argu when it comes to the previous argument, the reason why I am dismissive of it is I have not seen enough e enough testable repeatable, verifiable evidence that demonstrates that beyond a reasonable doubt. Anything less than that, it's not worth having. And if, if the arg and to quote the late Hitchens, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The, I have humored plenty of evidence about video games reinforcing sexist behaviors or what, or what not. I find the evidence wanting. And until somebody gives me some some substantial evidence that is not that meets the parameters, I'm going to I'm going to find the claim wanting. 
what do you think of are you familiar with Bre um, Chris Ferguson's recent Resident Evil study where he asked people to play Resident Evil 5 and Resident Evil 6 um, different people mm -hmm. for 30 minutes and then he had he also had them take a questionnaire too uh, to determine their racial attitudes and, and basically the, the games didn't seem to affect the questionnaire but he also had them perform a real life test where they would um, where they would have to ask somebody to, to endure mild discomfort over a period of time of their choosing between zero and 20 seconds. And people who played Resident Evil 5, um, they, so the, he, they were testing about race, basically. But what he found was that in, in the people who played Resident Evil 5, both groups, both people played 5 and 6, both both of those groups of people would would ask black people to stick their hand in the water for only eight seconds on average. Whereas um, for, for, for white women, it was different. Whenever they were asked to have, have a white woman stick their hand in the water, the white women, um, the people who played Resident Evil 5 asked them to do for, so for six seconds. Whereas the people who asked, who, who played Resident Evil 6, they asked them to do it for 10 seconds. There was a four second gap and uh, what do you think of that? I feel like there's, I haven't, I haven't gone too much into that study, but there's way too many questions that I have with the with the with the procedure and even even what the um, what the whole thing is tr is trying to test for. I'm trying to well, figure, he was trying, trying to, to find out if the people who shot the black zombies in Resident Evil 5 are the mostly black zombies versus the people who shot the mostly white zombies in Resident Evil 6, whether or not this influenced the way that they would um, react to causing a person mild discomfort. And so the hypothesis was seeing if they played, if they shot the black zombies in Resident Evil 5, the mostly black zombies, are they going to make the black people in real life endure a longer period of discomfort than the group that played Resident Evil 6 instead. That was like the main thing they were looking for. Yeah, I feel it I feel like that would be I feel like that would be you There of course of course the bigger question is is um if they're if they're only testing like say Two hundred or three hundred people—that's nowhere near enough to make any to make any conclusion that's substantive. It was like a hundred seven people, I believe, or something like that. That's only just enough to piss people off. <laughs> like, if you're going to be doing a, stu a study that's going to be as on something as broad as race relations, you need a hell of a lot more than a hundred and change. Well, you should you should yell at him then because I'm still interviewing him. I've already interviewed him a few times. And as far as, as far as that study, there's just there's it's too circumstantial for me. And I I know some might dismiss what I have to say because I because I don't because I don't have an H index or or anything like that. But just from just from my own layperson perspective, only using a hundred or so people on on something like race relations when there's when and of course, of course, it's ju it's just as likely that outside factors could could play into things. There's just way too there's just way too many unknowns that I have with that um, bit with that bit of research, especially the especially the dif the difference between shoot shooting shooting zombies of a, of a certain ethnicity versus putting some versus putting someone's hand in water like the whole the whole thing just strikes me as odd but well you should yell at him in my chat or just tweet at him and say hey here's my critique he's pretty open to stuff like that what do you think of the arguments about video games causing real world violence bullshit <clears throat> bullshit bullshit Bullshit. This has been this has been something that has been thoroughly examined over the past thirty years. 
And the most that people have been able to come up with is circumstantial at best. And like I said earlier, when it comes to this, if somebody's going to claim that X causes Y, it should always be X causes Y. And no, ma no, matter, who, no matter who's playing or, wh or what they're playing, and it should and it should and it should happen in a very reliable form. Every time I look one of the, at one of those studies, there are so many asterisks that the study is ultimately useless, or or actually or ends up confirming that that isn't the case, or there's just a lack of sufficient evidence to even make a claim. If in, if anything, I'd if if there's I'd say I'd say that I'd say that it, that you'd have a better chance looking at say the, say the mental state of the mental state or mental circumstances of somebody who commits the crime rather than video games and after, after especially since you're going to have to answer the question there's millions of people playing di playing different games at any one time and only a point a percent of a percent of a percent of a percentile is actually committing crimes. Some political activists believe that using social media campaigns to demand artists change artistic elements of their work was a good thing, such as hashtag change the cover. What do you think of this tactic? I think, I think it creates a chilling effect. Where pe where um art where artists have to feel like they have to walk on eggshells regarding what they put out, and because and because of that, have less of an incentive to even create art. There's a whole there's a whole rabbit hole that can be done that can be done with like say transgressive art, but my mind's my mindset has always been that a lot of a lot of um activists who who argue it's a good thing haven't given much thought to where the line is drawn because the line just happens to conveniently be in their favor at that time so i'm rethinking this um i do think that when people engage in these sort of tactics especially in such a, a public way like a social media campaign like this i do think that it, it does have the potential um, if not actual, and probably actual, effect of being having a chilling effect to some extent on the industry, but also, and on, on artistic freedom, which I think could be a problem. But isn't it just the free speech of the of the people who are like demanding that they change the game? It's <sighs> whenever I don't th whenever it comes, it's a case. It's a case where there isn't a. There isn't a universal standard that can really be applied. It has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it comes down to intent. I would demand, demanding that the cover being changed, a lot of the demands for that seem to, seem to mainly be ideologically driven or emotionally driven. And by, and by that I mean, this, this made me uncomfortable, change it. When it's ultimately their choice to even look at it. Or if it, or if you see if you see it on the sh if you see a certain cover on the shelf at a comic store, it's ultimately your choice to continue looking at it. You could look somewhere else, or and you don't even have to buy the damn thing. Whereas when um when there's when there's demand for ch when there's demand for cha for change due to either poor either poor quality or pr or predatory practices, I think that is a different kettle of fish. I think in those kind of situations, it's no diff it's no different than they than say demand for a defective product to be recalled. You know, like all all the demands and all the controversy that happened with say the Corsair back in the back in the um not the Corsair the Corvair back in the sixties. That thing was that thing was a death trap, and people who were calling it out for being a death trap were well within their rights to do that. Do you, and consumers always have the right to to criticize the products that they might purchase or have purchased. 
Yeah. Or the diff- websites that they visit too, of course. Mm-hmm. The the difference being is that is that when 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 people were get I'll use Battlefront Two as an example, since that's the famous one. When people were getting on that game for its predatory practices. Well, well hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's no, I, I'm not even going to remotely argue with you about predatory practices. I, I I'm talking about artistic elements. Yeah. Now, when it comes to art, when it comes to artistic elements, um. I think I think that there's been there's been a whole lot of talk about localization over the last few years. Of course, I think you I think you even broached the t- the topic at one point. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about it in a minute too. <laughs> um, the way that people I when people are putting in some sort of investment, whether it be time or money, in a in a localized version of a, of a foreign product. They'd like to be able to have the closest, at a reasonable level, experience to what a native speaker would have gotten. I have to say reasonable in that sense because because uh, obviously there's a whole lot of um, a whole lot of asterisks you have to account for when bringing something from one language to another, and people who do that have to be have to be borderline writers in and of themselves. But the thing is, you are you are, at the end of the day, acting as a steward for that given work, to bring to bring it to an audience that doesn't speak a given language. I well, we're, I'll ask you in a second here. Where do you think the lines are between criticism and advocacy of censorship? Um, intent. If the in- if the intent of critic of criticizing a given product is to tr- is to try and to try and um ha- to try and have the pr- have either the product improve um be in a not defective state or so that or so that the developers know that they mi- the developer whoever's responsible for it is aware that they made a defective product that that is key. If the if the intent is more is more of a control grab, or out, or out of out of personal convenience, that's where the problem lies. And intent is not one of those things where the, where there's going to be a universal solution. It has to be case by case. So when, whenever there's some thing that that people are riled up about, I always try and look at okay, why are they riled up and do they do they do they have a point if they're demanding changes? Do you have any thoughts on the removal of content from Japanese or other games when they are localized? It's a terrible idea because again, somebody somebody who's picking up that kind of work um, will want the same experience. And whenever this kind of thing comes up, I I would always I would always ask. Imagine this. Imagine this kind of "quote-unquote" fixing by remo- by removal in, let's say, let's say a film coming out of France. One, one where the, one where they cha- one where the languages change so that so that it doesn't com- it doesn't resemble the ori- the original speak the original um, speech as closely as it should as it should or tries to pass off. A very, a very French environment into into being more American. Um, this is you could also look at how Al Khan, the guy who was running Four Kids later Four K Media or whatever they're calling themselves these days, got everybody real angry at him when he tried to defend the changes that he was making to to say One Piece and the like. That it was making things more Western. It's it's really it, it's a it's disrespectful to the culture. To, it ver- it very much is. Yeah, and it not and of course the art the artists their vision is being changed from whatever dialogue or scenes you've taken out and replaced with something else. Like you've seen with like the, the prison school one where they, they literally have this entire scene about Gamergate that was never in the original film. They just added it in and, and redubbed. They, they, they deliberately mistranslated 
and localized the game. And I do rem- I do remember saying around around that time when somebody was like, "Why are why are you why are you so annoyed with it?" And I said, "You're dating the work." Because that's going to have that's going to have a different that's going to have a different Im- impact years from now. And I be- I believe that a given work should should be able to be enjoyed regardless of era. This is the reason why it's in the same vein as why I keep um taking shots whenever I get the chance at Seltzer and Friedberg movies because none of them have ever aged well. They may have I don't they even may know who have, they are. <laughs> those were the guys behind the behind the uh, bump the the um horror parodies like Scary Movie and then Meet the Spartans and all that shit. Parodying the parodying the current trend. But the problem is that doesn't last. Some and, critics. Oh God, you have more. Well, it's it's just that some, with uh, with that kind of thing, it's a it's a case of not of um not seeing the not seeing the bigger picture because they're only focused on the moment. Some critics of Gamergate have argued that the movement was mostly or entirely right wing. Do you think that was accurate? No. I would. It is. It. I could see where they would have that kind of mindset because they because they view left wing and right wing as a binary, or rather, or rather, they view their whole. Their, they have a particular worldview that is um, in group, out group. The left right doesn't matter. They just happen to be left wing, so right wing is the out group. I think. I think that, and I'm. I'm pretty sure there's been plenty of material to back this up. The majority of gamers and the majority of people who were involved in Gamergate were not right wing. More of them were politically ambivalent, independent, or some variety or some variety of the of the three. Or they or they just never um put their political affiliations front and center. Which is a nice way to say most people don't most people who were involved did not care about left wing or right wing. Well, it depends on what you mean by like don't care, I guess, because like That's why I said ambivalent. Yeah. Well, I don't think even ambivalent. Um I think it was an extremely diverse group of people. <laughs> it was it was a number of different political views. Some of whom yeah, were ambivalent, it, yes, but other people who did care about politics. I would say I would say the largest chunk were were ambivalent. Oh well, shit. We we don't have to speculate. We can just look at the data on this, right? So, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's where the data ended up going. That most were ambivalent or or apathetic or some form. No, I don't know of... where you're getting that from. You... Are, you, are you talking about the the Brad Glasgow and Chris Ferguson survey, or the Game Politics one, or something else? I'd have to double check because things might have gotten crosswired in my head over over the years, but I distinctly remember that mo that um that the results were all the results were all over the place and inconsist and inconsistent. Not if you're talking about Glasgow survey and Ferguson's. I don't think any of them have shown that. Hmm. I might I might be misremembering. Any anyway, moving on. No, we're gonna go ahead and look it up. <laughs> I'm just scrolling through it right now. Can't mm-hmm. control F. Very annoying. Um. Although while you're doing that, I sh- I should I should note when it comes to that whole that binary mindset. I think that I think that was the reason why the Sandy Beaches incident was able to happen the way it did. Sandy Beaches. Sandy Beaches was a pseudonym for a guy who wrote for the Mary Sue. Wrote several articles that were complete and total bullshit, and all of them got published. And then he then he revealed that they revealed the whole the whole thing was 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 him um, seeing how see, demonstrating how low the standards were, basically a gaming version of the SoCal hoax. Um, SoCal was a um, si- was a scientist who wanted to show that some scientific papers had low standards. So we'd make so we'd put in these um 
papers that would have that any standard peer review would have flagged, but they ended up getting in there anyways in the, in the papers he had submitted, and then revealed the whole. Th- SoCal was a ho- SoCal was a hoax that I that I did just to showcase how bad your standards are. Okay, so what do you want to look at? Do you want to look at at uh, self identification, or do you want to look at individual policy preferences? Self identification would probably be the easiest in this regard. Policy preferences would have um, too many moving parts. Okay. So I'm um, adding up right now. <clears throat> Gamergate was 62.5% liberal, 23.6% moderate, and 7. 14% conservative. Now this is adding extremely, slightly, and just liberal slash conservative mm-hmm. uh, into one. But That was Chris Ferguson and Brad Glasgow. I know, I know game politics found basically the same thing. And then there's the... the Well, there's other ones too, but we don't have to get into that. Do you want to talk about your political views or philosophy? I am a radical independent, as, it, as I've called myself. Sometimes calling myself a political ronin. Political ronin? You know, is you know the Ronin, as in Wave Man, the Wandering Samurai th- kind of thing. Um, the reason the reason being is I never I have never ascribed myself to any one political party or political identity. I am a I am an issue by issue kind of individual. On certain issues, I may I may lean more conservative. On other issues, I may lean more liberal. Sometimes, as I discover more info on a given matter, I may end up shi- I may end up shifting sides. It's all about it's all about context and what I know. Have your politics changed since Gamergate or due to Gamergate? No. Are you okay with gaming sites criticizing games through a political or religious lens, such as a Marxist, feminist, Christian, or other lens? No. I'm not okay. I'm not okay with it because the reason, the because um of the three rules that Vincent Flanders once talked about in regards to web in regards to website and web design. This was in an article he po- he posted years ago called the. 15 biggest mistakes uh, made in web design. The second one was believing people care about your website. And the point that he was trying to get at was you need to design your website around three. Th- there are three things that you need to account f- that you need to account for and at least one of them. When people are coming to your website, they either want to be entertained, want information, or want to buy something. If somebody is go if somebody's going to a gaming site and looking at reviews or, or the like, they're looking for information on that. Whatever your whatever the political slant is, is irrelevant. When you say you're like not okay with them pl- criticizing the games through a political lens, what do you mean though? I mean, they should be criticizing the. They should. The person who's reading that article may not, may or may not share the same the same lens, which under which undermines the, undermines any intent to, um, have have that. I think that I think that the criticism should be should be, is this game good or bad, and why, if we're if we're talking about just a review. If we're talking about like a preview, this sort of criticism shouldn't even be that sort of political leaning shouldn't even be there because it should be about informing people of the of the given game. If you got a hands-on demo, it should be about exploring your experience with the hands-on demo. What if they want to explore their experience with the hands-on demo from a woke perspective or a Christian perspective? And they want to do that for other people who are interested in reading things from that perspective. Then the 
then make that make that clear make that clear from the start that that um you're going to be doing that. Don't try and um pull a Janus on me. This is why I don't have a even though I don't read anything from the site, I don't have a problem with say Christ centered gamer because I know what it's going to be about. Do you think that other gaming sites don't do this? I think that the repeat offenders don't. Who? Your 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 Whenever we whenever we see someone like say Kotaku or sometimes IGN or the like, where they um, focus focus more on the their particular ideology, went in something that's supposed to be neutral. That's where the, that's where the problem lies. Oh, when have they done this in ways that you don't like? I forget. I forget who... There was a big example with one of the Forza games where someone decided to use that article to talk to talk about current events. Not the article, the review of a Forza game to talk about current events in Australia. I don't live in Austra I don't live in Australia. I don't give in the if I'm re if I'm reading something about Forza, I don't give a shit about us about current events in Australia. I care about I care about is this iteration of Forza any good? What were they talking about regarding Australia? I'm just curious. I don't I don't remember. I just remember they I just remember they veered off from the, from the point of the of the article that the point that was that was hinted at at the top and decide and decided to just veer off into their own into their own thing. Do you think there With, can be do you think there can be any value in analyzing games or other works of art through a political lens? I think there can, I think there can, but the games that you the games that you can do them with are very limited and the angles you can take it with are also very limited. Much in the much in the same way as as um as as doing as doing religious perspective analysis with with um Say with say mythological figures or or the like. Um, a few uh, about a, about a year or so ago, on the Geek Watch podcast, we did a dissection on the on the narrative about Superman being a Jesus metaphor, and how how that came how that came how that came to be a thing, and the merits and flaws with that approach. We never we didn't say that to people who think that it that it is were wrong, but that the idea of it being intrinsic to the character was false. Some people say that Gamergate was the quote first battle of the culture war unquote. Do you have any thoughts on that framing? I'd hesitate to call it the I'd hesitate to call it the first ba the first battle, and that's really something that you can only that can only be stated in hindsight, much like um, ages when it comes to a given um, historical look. Um, I think th I think that the that the quote unquote culture war was always going to happen. It was just what was going to light the match. If it wasn't Gamergate, it would have been something else. What do you think of the framing of Gamergate being a response to a moral panic about video games? I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure if there if there really is a moral pa a moral panic in that sense. What do you think of the framing of Gamergate as a battle between those who believed in classical liberal values? Like artistic freedom, free speech, and pluralism, and those who don't. I th I think that I think that was something that happened downstream, but it was. But I don't think it was ever the int it, the intent, and I don't th I don't think framing it as such is accurate. All right, interactions with the other side. Did you interact? First off, are you doing okay, or do you want to take a break real quick, or are you good? I'm good. I'm good. I can do this. I I do I do this kind of thing every day. Every day, I could do this all day, man. All right. Did you what? interact with any anti-gamergate people? 
I did. I did. I had some. I had some back and forths here, here and there. It it didn't it didn't amount to much because a lot of because a lot of them were more interested in were more interested in name calling or um were more were more interested in trying to get some magic gotcha on me and I just I just wasn't interested I'd ra I'd rather have an adult conversation with adults plus some as the, as the saying goes, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So if they wanted to bring me over to quote unquote their side, probably shouldn't have looked at me like like I'm get like I'm guilty until proven innocent. Why do you think they looked at you that way? Probably because I probably because I was asking too many questions. Did you ever change anyone's mind on Gamergate? I I did. I did for I did for a few folks, or or at the very least, I demonstrated to them that they weren't getting the full picture. I never attempted to proselytize anyone. I simply gave I simply gave my perspective, and I think what helped was the fact that I that I'd always present myself in as in as new as neutral as grounded a way as I could, which seems to have been something that's carried over. Into how I perform as a podcaster. Did you see that big six-hour video on Gamergate that just came out? Uh, Savvy writes books. Made it. No. Okay, I did actually watch this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so she says she spent three weeks and read two books. She read Grim Jim's book, and then she read uh, Zoe Quinn's book, and she made like a pretty, I think, mostly fair video. But she thought that this was the complete story, and she basically only covered the first, uh, first like two months. It was, it was. She covered some of the stuff leading up to. She covered feminist frequency, um, uh, the Wizard Chan incident, um, and the Polaris Game Jam, and like the Zoe post, and like the very first like couple weeks of Gamergate. And I'm like, oh no, hang on. There's this huge other about. There's this all this other. <laughs> well, you know, this is you do spent three weeks on this, and and this is one of the better, one of the best anti gamergate videos I've seen. Perhaps, perhaps the best one. Um, but it's it's you still have only scratched the surface. This thing is so big, Mildra. I mean, I would know, right? I, I'm on two yeah. hundred and fiftieth hour or something recording alone. Not not to mention all the background research and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a huge, insane topic, um, which I guess is why it's important that I do this book <laughs> so that finally, finally, there's one thing that everyone could look at. Um, and of course, like, I don't think, I actually, I don't think that people should only look at my work. I think that you should look at like a plurality of perspectives, um, um, including this among others, but yeah, it's, it's such a huge thing. I'm, I'm glad though, that I've been able to include a huge number of different viewpoints and and historical events in this in this work though. Mhm. Mm yeah, I could see that. This is when it whenever it comes to movements of of any kind, it's never something that you can just um write in a couple in a couple sentences. Now look and if you need a historical example, look at the complicated um powder keg that was Europe pre World War One. Darkspined Zim says she covered a lot of the events before Gamergate started. Yeah, she she actually she did a really good job. Um, though she didn't know about the Colin Israel stuff, I guess, um, because she didn't include that. Um, I don't know if that would have changed her mind on some things, but or the Alka Loka stuff too. But that was after GG. Are you friends with anyone on the other side? Not re not really. It's not been from lack of trying. I tr I try to I try to keep a um a a open attitude, but some but some folks don't see don't see it that way. How could the conversation about Gamergate have been more productive? Um. 
not tr not treating your not treating your other side like the devil could certainly help. If like I like I said, if if when the when these ethical violations were found, if the, if if it was if it was quashed and the pe and the people involved were suitably um, punished, so much could have been avoided. I li I liken the. F if there's any of the seven deadly sins that ended up that ended up leading things to escalate in the manner that they did, it's pride. Why pride? The pattern that I've been setting up throughout this entire interview is that a lot of a lot of people believe that they were superior. That they that they ha that they had a much better morality because they are because they were in the in group, and it was the out group who needed to raise themselves to be more right. I don't mean that as in right wing, just correct. And because of the, because of the fact that they were that um that mi that kind of mindset clou can cloud one from seeing a problem before it becomes a problem. Do you have any you know, thoughts? It's hard... Go ahead. It's hard to convince someone who who's they're wrong when they can't, when they when they have so many other people saying that they're right and they're perfect. Do you have any thoughts on not your shield? If it weren't if it weren't for the fact that a lot of journalists were were trying to were trying to create that myth of Oh, all of oh, oh, all the gamers in their mom in, in their mom's basement d with a dusty handful of Cheetos or what have you. Not your shield wouldn't have had to be a thing. The GamerGate discussion was widely censored online. Why do you think that was? I think we, I th a lot of a, a lot of so, a lot of social media um was within was within that same bubble as far as far as the people who were managing and you notice that there's a certain pattern no, to notice even now where a lot of the people who say for are starting stuff with Mark Kern are middle management and the way I the way I see it the re the reason the reason it what it was was it was um because you either had you either had people who were moderating who were who were ideologically captured or you had people who who their ma their main trusted source of information was ideologically captured and was giving them bad data we have before we move on away from the other side to harassment let's talk about i'm gonna go ahead and screen share this real quick brianna Wu just sent this tweet out which i can't see because she has me blocked <laughs> uh you can archive it put in the archive yeah let me do that oh someone already archived it already i'll well, just give, give me the archive link here all right <clears throat> so Brianna Wu, and uh, Wick talked about this too. We can go over Wick's thing real quick. Brianna Wu says, you have to have, you want to have a real discussion about why I don't plan to run for office again. It has nothing to do with APAC or money. It's because I am not convinced progressivism is a force for good in American politics anymore. Right now, you're in New York chanting bomb Tel Aviv and siding with actual theocratic terrorists. It's because you can't run a civil rights organization or a civil rights movement without by telling everyone who disagrees with you to shut up. It's because talking to Republicans is seen as a betrayal, something you have to do in a democracy. It's because you can't form a coalition to do anything because no one is interested in getting along any with anyone. It's because the policies we are advocating for are... The advoc Sorry, it's because the policies we are advocating are getting stupider and stupider, and no one can say so. 
It's because the movement is a panopticon police state where you cannot say anything out of step with the extreme or you get devoured by cannibals hoping for clout. You can't even say hideous flag design isn't good because your DMs will fill with angry people that literally happened yesterday. My politics have not changed. My appraisal of who is able to get the public policy I believe in past has. This is a cultural dead end. I'm going to go work with the Democrats who can act like adults. What do you think of what she said? So close. What did she get wrong in your estimation? What she is, what she is, what she is dealing with is something that I've seen a lot of people who considered themselves le considered themselves left wing end up dealing with the the constant shifting of the Overton window, and that and anyone who and the and that constant shifting is a purity spiral. And the reason purity spirals are called spirals is because the, is because they const is because they constantly go further and further and smaller and smaller. And of, co of course, the people who survive each shrinking are one step more hardcore than the last. The what I see what I see out of the reason why I say so close is she is is there's still the, there's still the mindset that this is a that this is a side that this is a sides thing. A smarter thing would a smarter thing would inst instead of go instead of doing the I'm going to work with the Democrats who can act like adults. Work with anyone who can act like adults. Well, I don't I don't I I see why she's she used the word Democrats here because she's a Democrat and that's who she's going like to vote for presumably, but I. I think she is okay with talking with Republicans. Like she even says that one of the problems is that talking to Republicans is seen as betrayal. And like her co-host on her podcast is a conservative. Like I, it's rare I defend Brianna Wu, but like I think she's I think she's she talked with me. Did you see that? I saw it, but I have I haven't seen the full thing. And obviously, since she's got she's got me blocked, it's not it's not like she's going to be high priority. Well, here's what Wick had to say. And to be clear, Wick used to be uh, an employee of Brianna Wu's and still works for Progressive Victory, um, which is nothing wrong with that as long as he discloses it. W uh, Wick says, whatever could have happened to turn her off from y'all's way of thinking, was it the endless stream of acidic attacks? Maybe it was the constant mischaracterizations. So y'all could get the big dunks and high five your buds. Anyway, I guess we'll never know. What do you think of that? Sound, sounds like a shaming tactic. That Wick's engaging in or that he's pointing out? That he's engaging in. Because so if he... If he Go ahead. Because... It was... Because it wasn't... It was... It was because he's, st he's still engaging in that two sides thinking. Except for, I guess, in his view, he's he's taking the sides as being the progressives versus the like neoliberals, whatever you'd say, normal liberals. Yeah. Oh, ultimately, the name of the, the name of the sides it um doesn't matter. It's the, it's the it's the it's the fact that he's still he's still he's still using one side he's still using an idea of one side as a scapegoat. And. I use that term because of what scapegoat originally meant, that ritual of piling all the sins onto a goat, sending the goat out of the village to die to die in the wilderness, and everyone thinks that they've absolved themselves of their sins because it's on the goat. All right. I think we might even finish this before 10 CST. Um, we're making good progress. Why do you think some people claimed that Gamergate was about harassment or hating women? I think it was there's two possible answers. One of them is ideological capture, the other is 
a hive mind. I think a, I think a lot of people looked at the bad articles that were that were put out completely uncritically because they because they were still assuming that dam of legitimacy was still up and rinse repeat things things end up going out from there. What do you think of the studies about Gamergate and harassment, such as the Women Action Media, Newsweek slash Brandwatch, or Nimbus studies? Um, I take stu I take studies with a with a significant grain of salt because it's very easy to to say to say um, to say X out of to say X out of Y agree, and um. Ignore the fine print that you of say small sample size or something. There, I can I understand why um, Churchill had said there's three kinds of lies in the world: white lies, damn lies, and statistics. Do you perceive the truth as being unknowable? I perceive I perceive that the that um. There is never one simple answer for the truth. That it's always a series of questions that is to be pursued, with the knowledge that the that the more that you know, the more questions you're going to have. That's true of Gamergate for sure. <laughs> Many things in life, actually. What do you think of the Gamergate anti-harassment patrol? I don't I don't put too much stock whenever I hear the word harassment getting thrown about because the bar has been lowered so much that what constitutes harassment could be someone sneezing on their left side for all I know. And because of the fact that it's that it's treated so broadly um the just about anything as long as somebody thinks it's harassment then it magically it, it magically is and you have the most minor of offenses being conflated with actual malicious intent. Well, this next question could be interesting. How important to you was it that bad actors were condemned? Very, very much important. But equally important to not burn down the forest to stop to stop a few ticks, or or northern pine beetles, if you, for not to not to sound too not to sound too North American. Do you think most Gamergate people did a good job condemning harassment? I think a lot of people did the best that they could when it came, when it came to that. There's. Every, everybody knows the everybody knows the whole do not engage do not engage and, and the like um which has which has become kind of a standard with how um videos on on more contentious people are done the whole do not engage we do not condone harassment all, all that kind of stuff which what that some people may find that repetitive but what that ends up doing is defanging any bad actors' claims of harassment. Essentially st essentially stating, if it happened, I had nothing to do with it. Doesn't seem like that strategy has been working out well for the Gamer Gators and the Public Relations Department. But I don't think I, I I don't think anything would. I think it was deliberate. I think I think people deliberately said, you know what, fuck it, we're gonna exclude these people from our circle of concern, and then mm -hmm. whatever happened to those people happened to those people. What do you think? Yeah, it the game was rigged. The game was rigged from the start, you might say, and the the best that could be the best that could be done was. Let the boy, let the boy cre keep crying wolf. Because bad actors are going are going to claim harass are going to claim harassment um, until the cows come home. But what can be done is um, is is make is make it that it's that it's harder to substantiate it beyond a assertion. If you saw someone quote 
on your side, unquote, doing something you thought was bad, how would you handle the situation? Put them on blast. I've already done it. I've ha I've had a situation where I've had to put people on bl on blast for one reason or or another when they were doing something unacceptable. I had an incident of of that just a few months ago. Do you want to talk about that? In the, normally it's something that I would normally that is something I'd like to talk about, but this is far more serious. So I'm going to have to say no. Okay. You don't have to answer or talk about it, but did you experience any harassment during Gamergate from either side or from third-party trolls? No. Why do you think the media largely didn't cover harassment against Gamergate supporters? It wasn't convenient. Again, they need... Um... A lot of people need had a conclusion that they had in mind and were looking for validation of that conclusion. Do you have any thoughts on Zack Attack? I never I never really engaged with all of that. Oh, the mom bot um outing the doxers with Rudder House. Oh that oh that. Um Outing, outing a outing a do, outing a doxer. Oh, a bunch I've of doxers, a bunch <laughs> of the anti GT. You, you can read the article on it sometime. I can link it if you want. Um, yeah, I might I might have to refresh my memory, but um, it re it what is it what is it what does it say about some about someone's mindset when they, when they and theirs are complaining about um. Are complaining about harassers when they when they themselves are do are doing that and worse. Yeah, that's certainly true. A lot of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the con leaks? Um, I think that kind of the leaks were inevitable when 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 you've got a lot more eyes on this kind of thing. Do you have any thoughts on the term sea lining? It's just a well. The, well, the term didn't last, so I think that says more than I could ever do. What do you think of the burgers and fries stuff? I think that was the that was the nickname for the whole Five Guys thing. Well, yeah, from the from the Zoe post, and then they had their own IRC chat room. Well, it was an IRC chat room that people, some people used. Um, I think honest, honestly, when honestly when it came to that, it was it was just an, it was just another piece of straw on the pile. What do you think of the people who say that, look, this Burgers and Fries chat room, um, it looks a lot like harassment, or at the very least, if not harassment, people just being kind of dicks. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Like I said, I don't, when, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in, in, a lot of, in a lot of harassment claims unless I find something a little bit more legitimate than an assertion. Do you have any thoughts on GG Revolt? I never engaged with GG Revolt. When I think by the time I think by the time I had caught wind of that, I was already doing my own thing. Can you define what you think harassment is? I think I think when it is when it is maliciously causing causing distress either through either through direct engagement or through social isolation within within a within a within a given group that is what that was what would count among it whether it be di whether it be sending di sending threatening remarks or the worst stuff like do like doxing or um or e or even or even worse some um, swatting you know that that is where it would defi define harassment um but just but someone just saying 
X harassed me, um, I don't consider I don't really consider that as such because I don't have anything to really go on. I think there's a reason why show the receipts has become part of the lexicon. Six months ago, I interviewed Game Diviner. In this interview, I said that Ethan Ralph had harassed Brianna Wu. I believed this to be true at the time, based on the definition that I personally used at the time. I don't know if I would... I mean, I don't know if it... Be, I don't know if I'd call it harassment today, though. He's done a lot of really... Like, so, fuck. Are you familiar with everything that Ralph did with Brianna? I'm just, I'm familiar with everything that... Uh, I'm familiar with a good amount of stuff that Ralph did, period. And when I think about him, I just get disappointed. He's a, he's a terrible human being. Uh, he did harass people. Um, it's just a matter of if he harassed Brianna specifically. And, like, I think it's clear that he had very negative intentions towards her for a period of several years and wrote dozens of articles criticizing her but that's also free speech like he has a right to do that um and then he also ran live streams on purpose just to fuck with her and we have like chat logs showing that he has like no real journalistic reason to <laughs> to do this and he allegedly outed her as being transgender um using his 2006 forum post that he probably shouldn't have shared on his website uh, and I don't know if that's technically doxing or not. Maybe it doesn't meet the technical definition, but like it seems like it's kind of shitty behavior that he only did just to fuck with her. Like I don't know. It seems like he's he has a clear pattern of intentional behavior that is hostile towards this person, and that he is acting in a malicious way. I would say, is that harassment? Given how it, given how it, it's all about intent. I would, I would, I would definitely be willing to enter to entertain it. Okay. Yeah, because I'm. At the time, I thought, well, the intent is so obvious. Um. Yeah, but I, and and the trans thing might have crossed the line. I think probably that probably did cross the line. Um, like if he wants to argue and make fun of her because she's tweets stupid stuff out on Twitter. You know, eight years ago, like, that's fine. I don't care. You can write 20 articles about that. But I feel like that was, that was just unnecessarily personal. It has nothing to do with the arguments that she was making. Mm -hmm. What do you think about how the media covered Gamergate? I think that it was covered the way I, pre the way I predicted it was go it was going to especially when you're dealing with media that is significantly removed from gaming culture and looks at the idea of gamers as this alien thing. Even now, even now still looking at it that as this this bunch of this bunch of distant weirdos because none of that because the culture that they're in is so removed from it. Um in that in that reg and Let's also not forget that with a lot of meet with a lot of media types, they don't quite understand internet culture, especially with how quickly internet culture can move. So the way that they covered things did not surprise me one bit. You have the folks who are ideologically captured, and you have the the fact that so many don't comprehend inter internet culture or subcultures, and never have. If you were going to investigate Gamergate as an act of journalism, how would you have done it? I would have gone in if now I am approaching this question as if I am not involved in any form in any form when it comes to gaming. So I want I want to make that clear right out of the gate. I would have go, I would have asked around, gone on gone on forums, continued asking questions spoken with people who are involved with it um have some have some sort of sit down with some with some of the people who were um inv involved or or were major factors and go and go from there not with not with any sort of agenda but just what is your what is your story 
Are there any journalists you think did a good job covering Gamergate? I think the majority of the ones who did who did the most adequate job were the ones who were fully independent, who weren't part of any organization. I think this is the reason why, say, YouTubers would have a bit would have a better chance of being able to cover it fairly than anyone else. Did anyone in the media reach out to you for an interview to discuss the movement? No. I was too I was too small time for that for that kind of thing. The wor the most that I had was just being in a few was just being in a few live streams. That's it. Did you reach out to any journalists or media outlets who wrote articles about Gamergate to correct misinformation? No, I did not. Are there any most, specific... Go ahead. Mostly mostly because the way I saw it, they they were too ideologically inclined. And the last thing I wanted was for them to take something I say out of context to try and rationalize away what the conclusion they already had in their heads. Are there any specific articles or videos you want to discuss? Not ri not really. I've I've sent in the years in the years since. I fo I focused more on the mindset that was in Rebuild Initiative rather than Gamergate itself. And a bigger part of my fo a bigger part of my focus was always highlighting indies and sh and showing what else is out there in the gaming landscape. Because of, because of that, by the, by the, by the time that I had started to develop some momentum when it came to my platform and kind of came out of my shell regarding um, doing podcasts, a lot of the big stuff had already ca came and gone, and I was do I was doing my own thing with the temple by then. Do you want to explain what Rebuild Initiative was real quick? The central idea was highlighting games as alternatives that were that were were either quality indies or games that did not appear to be as ideologically captured. Thank you. Did the media's coverage of Gamergate increase or decrease your trust in the media? I never I I never had a whole lot. I never had a whole lot of trust in in um, corporate media as it as it was. If a journalist who got Gamergate wrong, in your view, is reading this now, what do you want them to reconsider? I want. I would like them to reconsider how sure they are that they know that they know the full story. Do they know the full story, or do, or do they just know the um, bits that someone that someone else told someone else who told them? What do you think the media can learn from how they covered Gamergate? It's important to have. It is important to have to um, actually. If, if there's anything that I think should be learned. It is how how um not only how important credibility credibility is with your audience, but also the consequences of what happens if you break that credibility. Would you like? Oh, have you seen the the Gamergate Wikipedia article? Yes, I have because a cer because a certain person used that to um say to say that they weren't comfortable with with me. Or, ra or rather, with my um, colleague Zan Xanatrix, and decided to have a to a um, hour and a half um, podcast recording drift off into the ether, all because all because of one Gamergate banner that he had on his social media. All of a sudden, he did a 180 on me, which I found completely unprofessional, and made that clear. Who did? You know, for the longest time, I haven't said his name because I because I wanted to give him some manner of respect because he's not a bad guy. 
and I didn't want to put him on blast. Diogo Nogueira. Oh, who is a t is a t is a podcaster of, of the podcast Weird Games and Weirder People, and a TTRPG des designer for things like Sharp Blades and Cosmic Spells, and a bunch a bunch of other um, OSR adjacent um, projects coming out of Brazil. Xanatrix and myself, who we, who the two of us have been a package deal for for the longest time. Um, we're on his, we're on his podcast on New Year's Eve. We went out of our way to accommodate him because he's in Brazil and we're in um, Central Standard Time. And when he asked for Zan's Zan's social media when he was going to put the thing up, he saw that, um, wanted me to explain what Gamergate was, brought up the Wikipedia article. I tried to explain from my perspective. He gave me the. I'm not com I'm not comfortable with this, even though nothing Gamergate related came up at all during the podcast. And he decided to just hold on to it. I asked if I could at least have a copy that I could share with the people in my Discord server under the pretense that it wouldn't be shared anywhere else. He declined. And I did not speak with him since. And Xanatrix will verify your story? Yeah. And you have screenshots or archives indicating that these were contemporaneous conversations that you took had. I don't know if it was contempt. I don't know if it was contemporaneous, but it was it was a conversation that was had. And you did record and this, or have other other evidence of you chatting with uh, the Weird Games podcast. Um, Weird Games and Weirder People podcast. Yeah, I. W I, be, I, be, I do recall that I did um, I did DM him a, co a copy of some parts of the conversation because because he was because he was having that conversation with me per, with me um, personally like I, I was a, it was a DM thing I'd have to do a bit of digging but I should be able to find it and Xanatrix can um, be, can back me up okay I'll reach out to uh, the podcast host and uh, get their side of the story too, of course. If a journalist... I already asked you one, didn't I? Yeah, okay. Uh, would you like to see, quote, the narrative, unquote, on Gamergate change in your lifetime? Ideally, Yes. However, the however the, pro, I think I think that so long so long as you have people who desperately need a dragon to slay, that's the one thing that's going to that is roadblocking that. What's that? The. The thing that the thing that's keeping that narrative are I would are I would say the people who insist and who keep using Gamergate as a boogeyman and ha and end up using Gamergate as a boogeyman every few every few months or so or try and use it as a pejorative for things they don't happen to like. Has your conscious experience as a human? been made worse to any degree because of the negative narrative about Gamergate? No. Because I would because it never because the experience with Gamergate never defined me in that regard. It was just one it was just one thing I I dipped I dipped my toe in for a, for a bit of for a bit of time and th and then moved on, and then moved on to up to other things. And I don't want to make it sound like I used GG as a platform for my own stuff. The only thing that changed was just me getting the confidence to do live streams, to do podcasts, and so on. What's your favorite video game? Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? You can give a few. <laughs> um... There's there's certainly a, there's certainly a few that I, that 
I'm fond of for different reasons. I will I will note that having having strong mecha having strong mechanics is an easy way to get my attention. Um, but I'll give I'll give at least one from each from each major generation that that I've been involved in. Um, with uh, with like the with like the NES, um, I ve I was very much I was very much a fan of the of the original Dragon Quest. And then, and then revisiting that when I did my research on console style RPGs. I don't like the term JRPGs. I've covered that elsewhere. Um, with the SNES, um, I know th I know there's plenty of obvious answers that people could go with, but I'm going with Hagane: The Final Conflict, which felt like a successor to the NES Ninja Gaiden, and was just as hard as N as NES Ninja Gaiden. The only reason a whole lot of people didn't try out Hagane was that for the longest time it was a blockbuster exclusive. Um, on the P on the PS1 end of things, um, I very very I very very much enjoyed um, way way too many RPGs. <laughs> I could go, I could go on a tangent for days when it comes to P when it comes to PS1 RPGs I happen to be fond of, but. I'll ve I'll veer off the obvious path and I'll br and I will bring up um, Front Mission Three. Because as an aside, being a Front Mission fan kind of sucks. <laughs> With the sheer amount of stuff that we don't that we haven't gotten. Um, on the P on for the sixth generation, I will note some um, being a fan of like Jade Empire and Otogi. Both Otogi One and Two, which were from which were from Soft Games. Um, although with Jade Empire, I always tell people to to play the PC version with the in style mod because it's a it's almost a completely different experience. Um, those are those are just a few. the The thing is, is that I'm I'm very much a fan of RPGs. I'm very much a fan of strategy games. Um, I'm. A fan of fighting games, but some fighting games don't love me back. Looking at you, SNK. <laughs> Art of Fighting Art of Fighting 2 gave me a bad experience, I'll put it that way. Um The only genre I I try and keep a wide variety of games that I play. The only genre that I typically there's only two genres I typically veer away from. That being simulators and um, and ta and tower defense, I'm not a big fan of the, of that level of passive experience. I know that four X that some four X games can be passive, but there's always something that you're doing, some sort of thing you're working for. With tower defense games, it's a whole lot of it's a lot of waiting to react to something. Or just or just playing in a reactive way, and that's like asking me to catch with my other hand. And with simulators, I prefer I prefer being in a, in, for lack of a better term, other worlds rather than trying to chase realism. Did you said you attended a GamerGate meetup in Los Angeles? Yeah, I was at I was at the one that was at Big Wang's at um at Los Angeles. Was that the only one you went to? Yes. How was it? It was a lot. Of, it was a me it was a mess. Um, I wasn't able to stay the whole the whole time because of schedule because of schedule conflicts, and I and um I had a I had a lot of fun, um. It was another one of those cases where I where I managed to make one drink last an entire day. <laughs> so I, I only had one beer the whole time and was just and was just um carefully sipping the whole time through, or or adding a bunch of wa adding a bunch of water to make it look like I'm drinking. Oh, but I had I had a lot of fun talking with a lot of people. Um, I remember that I remember that Dayak was supposed to be there, but he couldn't make it. I remember that Milo was also supposed to be there, but he couldn't make it. Um, I was it. Uh, 
the person, if there's one person who I developed, who I developed a pretty, a pretty good friendship with during my time there, it was Mercedes. And the highlight for me was being was being able to meet her after having so many back and forths with her since she since she got involved in the whole thing. What do you think of the trial? The one, the one that she, that she got that um she's been in. I've I've kept an eye on the on the eternal kicking of the can that she's been going through. The whole thing comes off like a kangaroo court. From what little I've seen, I have to agree. It's been what almost five years now. They it's still so... keep postponing the trial over and over again. It hasn't been it hasn't been five years, but it sure feels like it. Do you want to talk about the friendships you made during Gamergate? A lot. Obviously, guy, obviously, guys like guys like Nurgle, guys like Aaron. Even if him and I butt heads on on occasion, which was inevitable because he's from he's he's from Illinois. I'm from I'm from Minnesota. That the the old black and blue division rivalries will persist. Um, but no, I've there's been plenty of fo of folk that I've been fr that I've been friends with. That's how, that's how I ended up meeting up Zan. That's how I ended up meeting pl meeting plenty of peep, um, plenty of people, um, and in a roundabout way, I do have to credit um, my experiences with GG for helping me get out of my proverbial shell because a big th a a big thing about it was. When I started my YouTube channel, I had figured I'm just going to do recorded reviews of TTRPGs and that's it. But being on being on some of the live streams during that time and after, then starting my own that gave me enough confidence to say maybe I can start my own podcast and then everything just expanded out from there. Do you have any thoughts on Vivian James or other Gamergate related art projects? The Vivian James thing was cute, but I never I never put much stock into it other than a art idea. Um, I know that I know that Kukurio got pro probably the most mileage out of that. <laughs> he makes good art, and I'm fine mm -hmm. with people making good art. I like people making mm -hmm. good art. Yeah. What was your favorite moment during Gamergate? Um. I don't. I'd honestly say getting. I'd honestly say getting them getting to meet people on those on those streams, and then eventually the meetup. If you could have changed one thing about Gamergate, what would it be? Um. I I honestly I honestly think that that um. Dealing, dealing with the bad, dealing with the bad actors um, before before they could dilute, and the people who wanted to veer off into other things, um, quit more quickly is probably the is probably the only thing I can think of. Because again, as I mentioned before, a movement lives and dies in a momentum, and when you don't have a when a movement doesn't have a clear defined direction. Everybody's going to veer off into their own things. What would you personally have done differently during Gamergate? I probably, I probably would have pushed more for more for support, more for supporting, more for supporting indies that weren't playing politics. Like when it comes when it comes to supporting independent um, games and the like. To don't promote politics. What do you mean? What I, what I mean is people who are more concerned with put, with um putting out a a um game because when it comes to people in the indie space they 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 could use all the all the attention all the press that they could get and it's hard it's hard enough making a game when you're like a one man operation or making anything and giving those kind of people support I think would have gone a long way. Do you think that a lot of the game developers now are pushing politics, the independent ones? 
Um, I've obvious, obviously, I've had a lot. I've done a lot of interviews over over the course of the last five years on my channel. The majority of the people who are who are doing those in, who are doing those are far more concerned with getting their shit out there. <laughs> like they they don't. Re a lot of for a lot of them, they're a, they're a small or a one man team. They don't really have time for a whole lot of distractions. But sometimes and for a lot these of people, I mean, they presumably care about politics to a degree, right? I mean, like some if of they these people do. If they do, if they do, they never br they never bring it up with me. Oh, well, I, I don't. I mean, I don't know if you're interviewing like a representative sample of indie game devs. Um. There's a playlist on my channel that's uh, that's about 800 and f 850 videos long. Okay. Hey, dude, I could be... You, wait, please put me on the list. Did I just say some ignorant shit? <laughs> I, so you've, how many, I have, you've interviewed over 800 game devs? Yes. Game, game devs, actors, voice actors... Um, co comic book creators. I've interviewed well, a lot of independent folks. I, what I was more leaning towards wasn't the number, though. It was that mm -hmm. I'm not sure that some people would want to talk with you because they perceive you as being a gamer gator. <laughs> Most people perceive me as being the monk. And not, there's there's been three things that they've perceived about me. One, the whole the monk identity. Two, somebody who knows his shit about about um about Tape about tabletop and vi and video games, and and three, someone who the game is all is all that he is all that he cares about. So if you bring anything anything else, that's gonna then you're gonna be the one with the problem. If the whole when in Rome you do as the Romans do. But some of the game developers do care about politics, like like um, Chantel Ryan, uh, who's working on dark web streamer, is like. Always talking about the Palestine stuff and tweeting about it constantly. Oh, he. I've I've made it clear to people you can talk about that stuff that stuff all you all you want. On your platform. When you're in my house, you follow my rules. Some people are too connect are too attached, and they're not able to make that separation. I don't talk with those people. The, it's the whole thing of. You're here. You're you're putting on a uniform, and you're here to work. When when you're when somebody's on any of my interviews, the only thing that matters is the game that they're working on. Every everything else is secondary. Let's say it's ten years from now, in an online. Also, sorry for. Uh, <laughs> I guess that was a dick move of me, for uh, assuming. That you didn't have a representative sample, though I don't know if you do or not. Because, like, I again, I do you think that the people, the people who are these like woke people who want to make the progressive games that you don't like, would those people be willing to come on your show, or have they? I've had I've had some people who definitely lean progressive on on the show, but those though, but again, they ha they have an understanding that. When 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 the when the red light goes up, um, the only thing that matters is is the game. Do you let them talk about political elements of their game? Like if you were interviewing Hideo, Hideo Kojima, would you? And he wanted to talk about political aspects of Metal Gear. Let's say, would you let him talk about that? It depends on depends on context of the conversation. If if it be if it become if I feel like it st it starts to veer into proselytizing about a a a given form of politics, I'd be like, I'm shutting that down. We're moving on right now. Let's say it's ten years from now, and an online movement is looking to Gamergate for guidance for their movement. What advice do you have for them? Stay on target. If there's a certain goal. Everything should be focused on that. Everything should be focused on that goal. No other pet issues or or any or anything like that. If there's people who aren't who aren't interested in that and more interested in um, putting themselves over, put them on blast. 
what have you personally learned from Gamergate? I've 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 learned that a lot I've learned that a lot of people have more of a mouth than they do um actual actions. I've learned that a lot of people will talk will talk shit and not back it up. And if if anything, my frustration the frustration that I ended up having was a similar frustration that I've had for over a decade of people talking about how much they love games, lament lament the state of of give name a big name a big box entry, but aren't willing to go find alternatives. And this and this is why I have the mantra games not names. Do you see parallels between Gamergate and the way society currently discusses issues? I see it I suppose I suppose you could look at it as a canary in the coal mine in terms of a large swath of people having a having a very my way or the highway attitude contrasting with with people who are more who are more in a sensible center um or at the, or at the very least not as um tribalistic What do you think of the decentralized and leaderless nature of Gamergate This is not my first decentralized movement and I think I think that because of the fact that it because of the fact that it is decentralized and leaderless that is all the more reason why a clear direction needs to be maintained Would you want to do a Gamergate reunion sort of a big meetup once every 10 years or something like that I like I like meetups I certainly would I certainly wouldn't be opposed to it I could I could um I could probably I'd probably have a good laugh at how many people end up saying god damn you're tall <laughs> as if they as if they don't do that enough already Have you ever thought about writing a book or other project relating to Gamergate Not really that's not where my focus is my f focus now is on trying to make my own tabletop game um projects Do you want to talk about that how's that going Zan and I have been working on our on our on our own fan game contribution to the new to Final Fantasy and TTRPG form, um, codenamed FF Legend. We've been working on it for almost three years. It is very close to completion. Right now, it's just some at ed some um, editing, cleanup, and get and getting art. I plan on showcasing some aspect of it. At Sage later this year. Aside Sage, if you're not familiar, is the Sonic Arc Sonic Amateur Games Expo. Aside from Sage, where else can people find your work? Well, I am de I'm developing a it a itch page where I plan on putting um. This project, as well as any, as well as any future projects or homebrews, I have a few ideas that I'm kicking around on that front. Beyond that, obviously, all my vi all my video stuff is on is on YouTube, and I do plan on on um trying on trying to set up something on like Substack or someplace else for some of the stuff that was on my old blog, just refor just reformatting some of it. Oh. Uh -oh. For you personally, what would Gamergate being successful look like? A a um significant move towards transparency within um within the within entertainment media. You said earlier that Gamergate was very successful. To a, to a point, yes. If you could do it all over again, your participation in GG that is, would you? I haven't really ch I haven't really changed in terms of my outlook on things. So if a if another if another similar set of circumstance happened, the same I would have come I would have gone to the same conclusion. 
do you personally consider the Sweet Baby Ink stuff and the, the massive controversy that's blown up over the course of the past several months, well beyond just that, or past month, I guess, um, you could, would you consider that to be Gamergate too? No, because Gamergate never really left. At most, it was a slow boil for several years. And the f the fact that it the fact that it lives so rent free in the heads of pe of certain people is telling in regards to that. Not to mention on multiple occasions they tried to restart it because of the because of the sorry state of a lot of um, journalism websites needing some needing something to get those clicks. What do you think of this interview project? Oh. Uh, I think I think it's interesting if if a bit ambitious. Too ambitious. A man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? I agree, though I also think I'm up to the task. Well, every everyone who everyone who attempts to reach for heaven thinks they're thinks they're up to the task, and some regret it. Or I suppose another are. I suppose another line which I've seen get thrown around in game design is we don't do this because it's easy. We do this because we thought it was easy. Yeah, well, I thought I'd be done with this project like six months ago. Well, like large portions of it anyway. I could have um, told you that was that was not happening. People at the time were like, Wait, you wanna you wanna be done with the interviews in two months? I don't know if that's gonna happen. Um but I there was mission creep. Um that was the biggest thing. I've, oh, I've when you have, from, I went from going like, oh, I'll I'll interview twenty five people to oh, I'll interview seventy five people, <laughs> you know, something along when those lines. When you have, when you have something that was this widespread that had this many moving parts, just a few people was never going to cut it. I felt like there was an opportunity to do more, and I thought that opportunity was worth taking, and so I expanded the scope of the project. Mm -hmm. Some people reading this might hold a negative view of Gamergate. Do you have anything you want to say to these people? To those to those people, I I will simply say I'm I'm not I'm not angry at you. If if anything, I have a great swell of pity towards you because of the fact that that's all you can see when you meet someone. I, on the other hand, try my best to see the totality of some of someone when I speak with them. I always, when I do interviews, I always ask for someone's story, leading up to when they got into the hobby and w and when they decided to make the jump into designing their own games. Because everyone has a unique story in regards to that, and story is something that I'm very big on. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Oh, I would like to offer a bit of a bit of a prediction. Sure. Um, I think that um, be I think that when it comes to the when it comes to the current um setup, all of the stuff that Sweet Baby and and similar consulting form firms have been doing, the is go is going to is going to make the idea of consultancy. To a um, toxic pejorative. Um, Should it be? I'm not opposed to the. I'm not opposed to the idea of a of a um, consultant. I mean, I, to I when you asked me about that during Nurgle stream, I, I said that in certain contexts. I oh, that's we'll... right. We had this conversation. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I think that there's certain areas where they can be useful and certain areas where it, it doesn't make sense. Like, I want to hire this person because I'll let you say it. I'm not going to cut your answer. Go. Yeah. If if I if I need certain information on a piece of history, a piece of a piece of culture or a subculture, I'm going to hire experts on that. I am not going to hire some. I'm not going to hire someone whose whose expertise begins and ends with the skin the color of the skin that they happen to be born with that is the most boring part of anyone 
I'm also are... I'm also not going I'm also not going to hire someone if I don't trust that they're not going to act like the writer themselves. That's why I said I would never hire a sensitivity reader because I don't trust that they're not going to act like a like they're writing my book. Well, hey, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, we're gonna go ahead and raid food shops, so go check out her stream. Have a good night, everybody. Next few days, probably going to be focused mostly on doing research for immigration in January 6th, because I got that debate coming up with Mr. Shikaki. Xenomancer Craig's Manfeld has uh, backed out of the debate. I'm not sure why exactly, but it was supposed to be a 2v1 against me. Now it's going to be a 1v1, I guess, um, with two moderators, so that'll be kind of weird. But anyway, it'll be interesting, I guess. Um, but so check that debate out.